Breaking news in our changing world. Download the NBC News app. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. The person leveling the accusations isn't me, it's John Bolton. I have heard from sources, and you guys have reported, that Dr. Fauci, through Secretary Azar, had been banging the pots and pans very early in the year. I worked on campaigns. If that was a campaign event, it was a crummy one. Deadline White House is now two hours. Weekdays from 4 to 6 on MSNBC. Protests broke out. The coronavirus pandemic. The story. Emergency approval to treat COVID-19 with plasma. Many questions remain about how well it works. From every angle. How much of the increased tension was due to the militias that came here? On the ground. Deadly western wildfires in California. Entire communities were also wiped off the map. And in depth. One of the big concerns is indoor air quality. What are you doing to address that? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Tonight's vice presidential debate at the University of Utah's Kingsbury Hall in Salt Lake City is now just 90 minutes away. Kamala Harris and Mike Pence, the second names on the presidential tickets, will be center stage for 90 minutes tonight in a vice presidential debate that is getting a lot of attention in the wake of President Trump's coronavirus diagnosis. Back at the White House, President Trump tweeted a new video showing him outside the White House. He also spent some time in the Oval Office for briefings, even though he could still be highly contagious. At least 18 members of his circle have tested positive for coronavirus over the last week, but the two vice presidential candidates have repeatedly tested negative in the lead up to tonight's debate. Here's a live look inside the debate hall at the University of Utah. The candidate's desk separated by 12 feet, 3 inches. There are also plexiglass dividers. So what should we expect from them on that stage tonight? NBC News political reporter Ali Vitale joins me now from Kingsbury Hall, the room where it's about to happen. And NBC News political reporter Monica Alba is in Washington, D.C. Ali, we know about some of the COVID rules and precautions for this debate. No handshakes, those plexiglass barriers. What what else should we know about the safety measures and the testing tonight? And then let's talk about format and what this debate will look like. Yeah, Allison, I'm like the Aaron Burr character because I'm right outside the room where it happens. But inside that room, <laughs> there are some of the similar guidelines that we've seen from the Cleveland debate, but some of them that have been ramped up in the aftermath of President Trump's COVID diagnosis and some members of his family even taking off their masks during that debate. One of the rules that we're going to see is that if you take your mask off during that debate and you're an audience member, they're going to escort you out. Some of the other things that have changed on the stage, the candidates are going to be over 12 feet apart, so double that usual social distancing. And of course, we had that debate over plexiglass. We know that those barriers have been erected inside the hall, and they're going to be among the precautions for the candidates on stage. And then, of course, there's the format. We know that we're in this thing for 90 minutes, no sense of the topics in advance, but we're going to have ten, nine 10 minute segments where, the, the, hopefully at least, each candidate is going to have a chance to respond and not overly interrupt each other. I will say the brands of Mike Pence and Kamala Harris, certainly not the same kind of brand as Donald Trump, who's known to be brash and interjecting. And so I imagine we're going to see the rules generally adhered to here. And then in terms of the audience, we're going to have much smaller than usual. Frankly, I think it's going to be even smaller than we saw in Cleveland. Mostly those tickets mm -hmm. went to students okay. and people invited by the university. And again, those people are all going to be wearing masks, all COVID COVID tested beforehand. Monica, as uh, Ali just said there, the topics have not been released ahead of time, but there is really no doubt that the coronavirus will be one of them. How should we expect Vice President Pence to handle questions on the pandemic, especially given his role on the task force and the president's positive diagnosis? Exactly. We knew it was going to be center stage and a centerpiece of this debate 
before all of the news of the last couple of days and the president's own diagnosis, along with the first lady, and as you mentioned, all those members of their inner circle. But it takes on a whole new meaning tonight because the vice president has been the head of the coronavirus task force for the last six months or so. He has been the one who has had to actively defend the administration time and time again when they've come under a lot of scrutiny for the way they've responded to this health crisis. So he's going to be doing much of the same time tonight, but it has to be done a little bit more delicately. And in talking to those around the vice president, Allison, we understand he's going to have to be referring to his own running mate, the president, who is still recovering from coronavirus. So the irony there, absolutely not lost on the Pence team. But he's also going to be touting what, in their view, they feel have been some of the successes or the progress of the handling. And that's something the vice president has seen firsthand. He's traveled the country getting these ground reports. You can expect expect him to talk about that. But as Ali knows so well, Senator Kamala Harris has made her entire vice presidential nominee time on the trail about the coronavirus and dismantling the handling of the administration's response. So that back and forth is what we're going to be watching for, though I absolutely agree it's going to be a lot more polite, we expect. This, we're told, in last week was WWE. This week is a lot more C-SPAN, Allison. Yeah, I think people are really looking forward to that there, Monica. Uh, Ali, Kamala Harris is a former prosecutor. A lot of people remember her tough questions for Justice Kavanaugh, AG Bill Barr, when they've appeared on Capitol Hill. How will that serve her tonight? And should we expect that same kind of strong stance from Senator Harris now on the stage as a candidate for vice president? Well, Allison, her campaign and her staff love to remind that she's a former prosecutor and they love to say that she's going to prosecute the case against Donald Trump and Mike Pence. I think really the best framing of this that I've heard on a call with some count with Harris advisors earlier today, a senior aide said that while Harris is going to be on the stage with Mike Pence, really she's prosecuting the case against Donald Trump and his entire administration. The fact that Pence is the head of the coronavirus task force is a clear entry point for her to take the case to Pence. But at the same same time, you can expect the same messaging that we've heard from her on the campaign trail about the virus, about its impact on the economy and about the impact that it's had on Americans across the country. That is going to be the central messaging pitch. And so as much as these other issues are going to come up, I'm thinking specifically of things like the Supreme Court nomination that's potentially going to fall right in Harris's lap as a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Those things will come up, but we've already we can already read the tea leaves, frankly, from the campaign trail. Every time those issues come up, Harris and Biden turn it back to their central messaging of coronavirus, the economy, and the need to uphold health care for all Americans. And I think that's going to be the strategy on the stage tonight. We've seen her campaign during the Democratic primary. We know that when she comes prepared, she can land some zingers, she can land attacks. But at the same time, the, the thing about these debates is they can sometimes be unpredictable. And so you have to sort of prepare for for that as well. Ali, you could say this debate started earlier this week when the Pence team mocked the Harris camp's request for plexiglass barriers. Do you expect the vice president and Senator Harris to hit that hard or, or that low, if you will, tonight? A lot of people, as we've said, have been hoping that this debate will be more dignified and much more issues oriented than the first presidential debate. I think just given the politicians on the stage, you're going to see it have a little bit more of that vice presidential air that you would typically see on stages like this. But look, what a win looks like for all vice presidential debates is successfully defending the top of the ticket and maybe getting a few zingers in that'll lead the news cycle the next day. I mean, the mm -hmm. most memorable debates, those of us who love this politics stuff, remember, you know, 1988, <laughs> Lloyd Benson and Dan Quayle, my, my opponent, I knew Jack Kennedy, you're no Jack Kennedy, right? So if you can get off a line like that, there is a success factor here. At the same time, though, these VP debates, and all of us have said this, that typically they're pretty inconsequential Consequential, But given the stakes here, the fact that you have two, two men at the top of the ticket who are in their 70s, one of them was just diagnosed with coronavirus, I think people are really taking an extra look at the running mates in this case, Vice President Mike Pence and Kamala Harris, not to mention the fact that you're seeing interest higher in this election than really ever before in other presidential elections. And so I think people are really keyed in, not just on Joe Biden and Donald Trump, but on the people that they're running with and what they can further offer to these tickets. All right, Monica Alba in Washington, D.C., Ali Vitali in Salt Lake City, thank you for helping us get ready for tonight's big debate. 
So will tonight's debate move the needle in this presidential race? Let's look at where things stand right now in some of the first polls since the president's COVID diagnosis and some new numbers out of key battleground states. You know what that means. It is time to go to NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki at the big board. Steve, take us through the numbers. Yeah, so we got three new state polls uh, out in the last 24 hours here. Uh, three states Trump won in 2016 and three polls conducted in the wake of that debate last week and in the wake of the president's COVID diagnosis and hospitalization. Let's take you through them. First of all, how about this? In Pennsylvania, brand new Quinnipiac poll this afternoon, they put Joe Biden ahead of Donald Trump by 13 points, 54 to 41. Now, there are a couple other polls out of Pennsylvania in the last couple of days that haven't been quite this lopsided, although there was one that was 12 yesterday. Even if you average together all the Pennsylvania polls that are out there right now, you're looking at a Biden advantage of getting close to 10 points in the average. And as I say, again, 13 in this new poll. This is a state that Trump campaign has been talking up in the last couple of weeks when he narrowly won in 2016. They've been talking about holding on to it. But the polling news since that debate in Pennsylvania has not been good for the president's reelection campaign. We move to Wisconsin. Here's a poll not quite as lopsided as we see in Pennsylvania, significantly closer, but still an advantage in the Marquette law poll out of Wisconsin today. Biden, 46, Trump, 41. And then one more here for you, Michigan. Here's a new poll uh, from the WDIV in the, uh, Detroit. Biden, 48, Trump, 39, a nine point advantage all three of these states that I just took you through, we got these new polls from. Let's take a look here at the electoral map. They've got something in common. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. They got two things in common. They all went for Trump in 2016, and they all went for Trump by less than one point, fraction of a point in all three states. So we've been saying this. If you're Joe Biden and you're trying to chart a course to the presidency, your most direct path is by simply improving by less than a point on Hillary Clinton's showing in these three states. In the polling we're seeing today, he's doing it in Pennsylvania, he's doing it in Michigan, and he's doing it in Wisconsin. If he can make that stick, nothing else changes on this map. He doesn't have to win anything else. Those three states alone, moving less than a point, Biden could get to 270. All right, Steve Kornacki taking us through the numbers, showing us uh, what the path to 270 looks like right now. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Firefighters have had more favorable conditions, allowing them to push the flames away from homes, but the wind can change all of this on a dime. We can continue to expect protests as people continue to call for more answers to what happened and continue to call for that accountability. It's starting to feel like a typical general election. Both candidates actually out on the campaign trail making their pitch to voters. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I gonna decide, take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. Today's headlines can be hard to understand, and a lot of kids have questions, so we started a newscast for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition.
The person leveling the accusations isn't me, it's John Bolton. I have heard from sources, and you guys have reported, that Dr. Fauci, through Secretary Azar, had been banging the pots and pans very early in the year. I worked on campaigns. If that was a campaign event, it was a crummy one. Deadline White House is now two hours. Weekdays from 4 to 6 on MSNBC. Protests broke out. The coronavirus pandemic. The story. Emergency approval to treat COVID-19 with plasma. Many questions remain about how well it works. From every angle. How much of the increased tension was due to the militias that came here? On the ground. Deadly western wildfires in California. Entire communities were also wiped off the map. And in depth. One of the big concerns is indoor air quality. What are you doing to address that? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. What happens behind the scenes in the days and hours before the candidates take the debate stage? Joining me now, Philippe Reigns, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State and Senior Advisor to Hillary Clinton and NBC News political contributor and analyst Mike Murphy, who's advised members of the Republican Party, including the late Senator John McCain and former Governor Jeb Bush. Uh, Philippe, you are a debate prep insider, having readied Hillary Clinton for her 2016 debate with then-candidate Trump. Uh, talk to us about the last-minute preps that are going on right now for both candidates and their teams. I hope it's not much more than thinking about what I am going to wear and uh, do I want to have ginger ale before I go on stage? <laughs> because if you're cramming this close, either you're not ready or your staff is being really annoying. I mean, if anything, it should be people just being light. But I mean, I think up until now, um, you've been absorbing a lot. You've been studying a lot. You know, what, what Senator Harris and Vice President Pence have to do tonight is uh, interestingly more difficult than what the top of the ticket has to do, because Kamala Harris is not debating Mike Pence. Kamala Harris is debating Donald Trump. Mike Pence is not debating Kamala Harris. She's debating Joe Biden. So to some extent, you've got to do a lot of things at the same time. You have to make sure that you're getting the business done that your boss needs to get done. And you need to make sure that you're not falling into the same pitfalls that your boss might have the week before. You want to quibble through plexiglass with Mike Pence, that's fine, or vice versa. But you have a chance to talk direct to audience in a way that you said in the last segment is more important than ever, given the circumstances. Um, and look, these are two skilled people. This isn't spin. Mike Pence is, uh, is hard. <laughs> he is a machine. He is relentless. He is uh, not going to give an inch. And he's also not going to stay on the defense. And Senator Harris is a former prosecutor. She knows how to get to the core of something. I mean, this is an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. It's very possible that in that case, nothing comes of it. Mike, the vice presidential, vice presidential rather candidates are arguably not as well known as their running mates. So if this is a chance for voters to get to know them better, what should Kamala Harris and Mike Pence make sure they get across tonight? Well, I think Philippe is right. A lot of it is they're just surrogates. I mean, this is this is second bananas debating, you know, and so it's not that important. It's hard to remember, other than maybe Quayle Benson, a vice presidential debate that ever broke through in a meaningful way in a campaign, and, you know, Quayle's side still won. So if I were prepping Kamala Harris, I'd say, look, you can prosecute a bit on COVID because there's a disastrous record to exploit, and Pence was there. But don't try too hard to win. The Biden campaign needs a nice, boring debate where nothing happens, because everything is going their way. I would be wary of Pence. He is a good debater. I think the expectations are a little too high uh, for Senator Harris. I've been reading about what a great prosecutor she is and all that. I also remember I thought she was kind of a um, uh, not particularly effective candidate in the presidential primary campaign. Well, Pence is, is very smooth. So I think Pence will do the classic Republican stuff to try to define Harris as one of the most liberal members of the Senate, to, to kind of put the, the focus on her through some of the old Republican hits. It might have a little traction because due to Joe Biden's age, I think people are a little more interested in Harris than they would be in the, in the generic vice presidential candidate. And Harris, I think, will do what the Biden campaign has been successful at, which is keep the spotlight on the administration's failures on COVID. So I think that that'll kind of be it. But if I were Harris, no need to try to blow up the world and win the whole debate today. Just make it another day on the campaign. 
beat it to a draw, and that's a great day for the Biden campaign. Philippe, you mentioned the plexiglass barriers, which have really been a hot topic in the last 24, 48 hours. How does the coronavirus pandemic, the limitations uh, that it puts on this stage, how does it impact the debate and the candidate's strategies heading in? This is bad for his political health, because the thing that is on everyone's mind is COVID. I mean, to borrow a phrase from 1992, it's the COVID stupid. And um, this is essentially Mike Pence wearing a COVID tattoo across his forehead. You can't get past it, um, nor should we. Now, I mean, look, if you want to know what's going on with the Trump campaign, look at what Mike Pence has uh, signaled today. He is going to go after Joe Biden tonight on terrorism, on terrorism, not even the economy, not even on socialism not even on any of the second, third, fourth, fifth leading topics of the, uh, of the election. He is going to go to some old bag of tricks, um, like it's Dick Cheney up there, and go after Joe Biden for being soft on terrorism. These folks, look, let's be honest, I, I'm not supposed to say it because it's jinxing. Unfortunately, I don't think I have that kind of power. Donald Trump is going to lose this election. It really is a matter of by how much and where, and it might not be by big. But there is an element of, of what um, uh, of, of what Mike just said that's important is that the Biden Harris team they're now playing prevent defense. You know they don't don't know if they're up by fourteen. They don't know if they're up by twelve. They know they're up by up enough, but with twenty six days to go, that they don't have to light the place on fire. Could Kamala Harris dismantle Mike Pence? Absolutely. Does she need to? No. Should she try too hard to? No. It's not necessary. Every day that ticks away, I've got a clock over my shoulder that clicks down by the second. We sat here eight days ago and think about how much things are worse for Donald Trump. We're going to sit here eight days from now. There might not even be a debate. If there is, there'll probably be a lot worse for Donald Trump with very little time to go. This is really just, you know, give give the offense give give the, the offensive team a couple of yards here and there. Just don't. Don't let it get past that. It's yours. All right. Sticking with the sports uh, reference, Philippe, you, you <laughs> called the no hitter in the middle of the no hitter. We'll see what happens. Uh, Philippe and Mike, thanks you both for being here with us tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Tonight's debate will make history for a number of reasons. One of them, it's the first time a woman of color will take the stage as a vice presidential candidate. To help us understand why this vice presidential debate matters more than most, NBC News presidential historian Michael Beschloss. Michael, thanks so much for being here. Uh, Hi, the two Allison. most Thank watched you. vice presidential debates included female candidates, Geraldine Ferraro versus then Vice President George H.W. Bush in 1984, right. Sarah Palin debating Joe Biden in 2008. What made right. those debates so memorable? They were pathbreakers in 1984. People wanted to see if you can believe that things were so bad that many of the people, the viewers who were polled said they wanted to see if a woman could look like a president, if you can believe this. 1984, and Geraldine Ferraro stood up to George H.W. Bush, who said to her, not what, what very good idea, he said, Mrs. Ferraro, let me help you with the difference between Iraq and Iran. And uh, she came back and she said, Mr. Vice President, I almost resent that you feel you have to teach me about foreign policy. That set the tone for later debates. How has the landscape changed for Senator Harris since those two debates of the past? How do you think she will be judged on that stage tonight? Will it be harsher uh, than it would be for a traditional male candidate? I hope it's not. I think it will be from everything we see from surveys, even this late in, in human civilization. You know, Allison, we are 100 years after women were guaranteed the right to vote by the Constitution, and still there are a lot of Americans say that they have trouble seeing a woman as president or vice president. So unfortunately, it should not be this way, but one of the things that Kamala Harris will have to do is make sure that people see her as a possible and plausible future president. And that's especially the case because she's running with a candidate, Joe Biden, who's in his late 70s, 
Mike Pence is doing the same. Donald Trump is in his 70s. These are two vice presidents who uh, will not only be vice president if they are elected, but have a more than usual chance of being president. One in four vice presidents in history become president. What will you be watching for in particular tonight through your historical lens, if you will? I'll be looking to see if both of them look like people that people can feel comfortable with as a president. And that's the problem, because usually in a vice presidential debate, uh, the, the two candidates are trying to defend their presidential nominees and go after the other, you know, sort of doing it in the stead of the statesmanlike president. That's what Joe Biden did, for instance, with Paul Ryan in 2012 kept on really going after him. And the problem with that is that's very different from what most people think of as, as a president. The worst example for them not to follow tonight would be Dan Quayle in 1988. Lloyd Benson, his opponent, said, Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy, which was a not bad line. <laughs> Quayle completely blew it by responding. He looked like a stunned child had almost no rejoinder. It may be people, people think maybe Quayle is not up to being president if something should happen to George H.W. Bush. It really wrecked his national career. We have been talking so much about uh, the added attention on, on tonight's debate, given the ages of the presidential candidates, given that President Trump has the coronavirus right now. We do know that historically, vice presidential debates haven't moved the needle all too much in terms of Election Day. Are we putting too much attention on this debate? Do you think it will move the needle in this one? It's very possible. Unfortunately, it usually only moves a needle if someone makes a mistake and helps the other side. But this, as yeah. I've suggested, is a year when people are very conscious of the fact that whoever is elected vice president this fall, you may very well see in the White House at some time in the future. And the other thing, as you know well, Allison, we are in a year where people are hypercharged with politics. People who normally are not interested yeah. are obsessed with every single minute of this campaign. So I think the the result tonight is we could see the vice presidential debate tonight in American history that gets the most attention of all. It is a year like no other. It may very well be a vice presidential debate like no other. Michael Beschloss, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me, Allison. With the strong divisions leading up to Election Day, it may be hard to imagine that there are still undecided voters out there, but they will be crucial this year. In Arizona, some undecided voters are paying close attention to tonight's vice presidential debate. The latest poll from Data Orbital shows Joe Biden leading Trump by more than four points in the Grand Canyon state. MSNBC senior national correspondent Chris Jansing joins us now from Flagstaff. Chris, with both presidential candidates well into their 70s, we have been talking about this so much, President Trump battling COVID. The vice president and Senator Harris uh, now have elevated roles in this campaign, potentially a lot more uh, attention and, and more eyeballs tonight. Will they influence the undecided voters? And will this debate potentially influence the undecided voters you've spoken with? I would go even, Ellison, a step beyond influence to saying that tonight can be decisive. That's what they're telling me. I mean, I think Michael Beschloss was spot on. This really is unlike anything we've seen before, where, frankly, people don't even know, in many cases, the names of the vice presidential candidates. And what I'm hearing is not unique to Flagstaff, because I've been spending weeks now traveling these battleground states. And all along, it's sort of been building these questions about both of the presidential candidates' age and their health, and then you add on top of that that the president gets COVID, and exactly what you've been talking about, which is suddenly people start thinking, particularly these undecided voters, well, what if who's ever elected can't fulfill their term? And even if they do, even if, for example, it's Joe Biden, will he run again? If he decides not to, given his age, that elevates Kamala Harris to the top potentially of the pack running on the Democratic side. So I think we've never in truly never seen anything like this. And a lot of people are going to be paying attention tonight in such a way that they may actually be using this to make up their mind, which is something I have never seen. Allison. Yeah, most people have not, Chris. Uh, when you talk to voters who are still unsure, what do they say is is really holding them back? What are they telling you? 
I, I hear this all the time because I've been spending a lot of time talking to undecided voters. And frankly, we're in such a divided country that the question I get most is, how can someone still be undecided? And so I ask that question always. And look, not everyone is paying close attention when you talk about some of the folks who have other things going on. For example, one of the people we talked to, who was a mother with two young kids, she's been consumed with helping them at school and trying to you know, situate their whole family. She's working from home. There's so many other things that are going on in some people's lives. But more than anything, I think that some of those undecideds watch the presidential debate. And the word that I heard with my panel was what a mess. Let me play you a little bit of what I heard from a couple of the folks I talked to here in Flagstaff. The first time I was voting was four years ago, and I didn't feel like voting. It, like, there wasn't any kind of that, like, popped out at me. It's just hard to really pick one that I'm, like, passionate enough about to vote for them. So here's the other surprising thing. I asked them, so do you need another presidential debate or two to help you make up your mind? And not all of them did. So that just further reinforces the idea that this vice presidential debate, maybe it's with a small number of people, but a potentially important number of people who are using it to make their decision, Allison. Chris Jansing, so interesting to hear what undecided voters and flag staff think. Thank you so much. Sure. And thank you for joining us. Chuck Todd picks up our coverage next. And stay with us for the vice presidential debate at 9 p.m. Eastern. You are watching NBC News Now. Tonight, Pence and Harris face off. We're looking very much forward to the vice presidential debate. I want to thank the people of Utah for being so welcoming. A debate transformed by the pandemic and the president's coronavirus diagnosis. There's so many big issues at play right now. Stakes in this election have never been higher. The choice has never been clearer. The only vice presidential debate of 2020 is about to begin. Welcome to NBC News' special coverage of the only vice presidential debate of 2020 right here on NBC News Now. Good evening. I am Chuck Todd. You're looking live at Kingsbury Hall at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, where in just an hour from now, the vice president, Mike Pence, and the Democratic nominee for vice president, Senator Kamala Harris, will take the stage. And as we look ahead to tonight, there is no sugarcoating it. The Trump-Pence campaign is in dire straits, and VP debates are historically not turning points in presidential elections. With 27 days to go until November 3rd, the president is sidelined as he battles the coronavirus at the White House. In the wake of last week's rough debate performance, his support is falling dramatically in a number of key battleground states. New polls have Biden leading nationally by anywhere from 10 to 16 points depending on your news organization that you want to pick. Biden campaign is buying $6 million of ad time in Texas. They've saturated everywhere else. What does that tell you? Tells you a lot, doesn't it? And tonight, voters will see a debate that has been transformed top to bottom by the coronavirus, an issue that has dogged the Trump administration and his campaign. Plexiglass barriers have been installed between the podiums, even though Pence and Harris will be socially distanced from one another. Only if they're spitting at each other do those plexiglass barriers actually come in handy. There are, of course, ongoing concerns about the vice president's personal proximity to the White House coronavirus outbreak. For Pence, this is not the first time in the big stage, but the situation facing his campaign could not be more precarious. And for Senator Harris, this is her first time in the national spotlight of this magnitude. It's also the first time she's facing the unique challenge of being a running mate on the big stage, defending someone else's record. Our NBC News reporters are on the ground at the debate site in Salt Lake City. Jeff Bennett covering the White House and the Trump campaign. Ali Vitale covering the Biden and Harris campaign. Jeff, let me start with you. Um, mm -hmm. The coronavirus is front and center, whether the Trump-Pence campaign likes it or not. And the coronavirus task force head is one of the people debating tonight. Are they ready for a debate that is all virus? Uh, they say they are, Chuck. I mean, look, the, the coronavirus, as you rightly point out, is ever present here in the debate hall, both when on the stage with the preparations 
And then you can expect that this will be a, a topic of debate. As you mentioned, uh, Mike Pence heads the coronavirus task force. The White House right now is a coronavirus hotspot. And that is an area where I'm told that the Biden campaign thinks that Kamala Harris can gain significant ground. Pressing Mike Pence to explain how it is that here we are seven months into this pandemic, and there are now some 7 million plus cases, 211,000 deaths, no national testing strategy, no national mask mandate, no strategy uh, to reopen schools. Here's the, the other thing. We also know that Mike Pence is a dutiful, loyal vice president to President Trump. He never allows for any daylight between his position and the president's position. So I think that will be a thing to watch tonight, how he explains that. And if he wants to preserve for himself some political standing in 2024, should he want to run, how does he navigate any of that? I think those are two things to watch tonight. Uh, we heard from the president. Um, he will not be live anywhere. We didn't get a live picture. It's another tape, so we don't know um, if he was coughing. We don't know a lot of things about it. What can you tell us about this tape? He seems to be making a... a quite the yeah. claim here about being cured. Uh, I think there are millions of people with the virus that are curious about that. Yeah, and speaking of the coronavirus pandemic and how it will affect tonight's debate, I don't think President Trump did Mike Pence any favors by putting out that recorded video. The president is on tape, he's in the Rose Garden, he's talking about his experimental treatment that he received at Walter Reed. And then Chuck, he describes getting coronavirus as a gift from God. Take a look at this. They're going to say that they're uh, therapeutic, and I guess they are therapeutic. Some people don't know how to define therapeutic. I view it different. It's a cure. For me, I walked in. I didn't feel good. A short 24 hours later, I was feeling great. I wanted to get out of the hospital. And that's what I want for everybody. I want everybody to be given the same treatment as your president, because I feel great. I feel, like, perfect. So. I think this was a blessing from God that I caught it. This was a blessing in disguise. I want to get for you what I got, and I'm going to make it free. You're not going to pay for it. It wasn't your fault that this happened. It was China's fault. You're going to get better. You're going to get better fast, just like I did. So again, a blessing in disguise. Good luck. So uh, we could do a, a fact check for, for days on that oh one. Oh, my gosh, just, yeah. To, uh, to, <laughs> yeah, there, there, was, there was a lot there. Uh, but to bring it back to the debate, again, I think, I think Mike Pence will be forced to explain how it is that the Trump campaign continued to have these in-person huge rallies, including that event at the Rose Garden last Saturday, the nominating ceremony for Judge Amy Coney Barrett, where we don't know, obviously, how President Trump contracted the disease, but we do know that there are now more than a dozen Trump uh, uh, campaign officials and White House officials who attended that right. event who are now testing positive. Jeff Bennett, as you said, the president, you know, he only added to Mike Pence's sort of long response list that this debate is uh, going to, uh, I think, end up uh, being for him. Jeff Bennett, thanks. Ali Vitale, um, what is the Kamala Harris plan tonight? And I say that in that there are you know, there are all different ways she could be. She could be very aggressive if they want to be. Or at the end of the day, do they want to do no harm? I think there is the do no harm approach there. But frankly, Jeff was very gracious in saying that Trump made Mike Pence's job harder because we already were talking about what a steep climb Mike Pence had for tonight, defending all of the different things that Trump has said and done on the on the pandemic. And now that he's contracted the virus himself, it only makes it harder to get off of that topic. And that topic is exactly where Kamala Harris wants to be on that debate stage. On the campaign trail, every issue that has come up from the support Supreme Court to everything else has always been turned back to the coronavirus pandemic and the White House's mishandling of it. So the fact that Mike Pence is the head of the coronavirus task force, of course, that made that messaging easier. But the way that President Trump has talked even just in the hour before the debate. You see his Twitter feed, and it seems pretty clear that he's going to be live tweeting what's happening on stage, always wanting to insert himself into the narrative here. And frankly, there's no exception when you think about this vice presidential debate. Mike Pence is going to have to get up there and play defense. And for Kamala Harris, she's just going to continue pressing this message, prosecutor style, as her team likes to remind, on the mishandling of the pandemic and the way that that has impacted the economic recession and all of the other crises that the American people are facing right now. I would say, though, 
And there's a few open threads from Joe Biden's time on the campaign trail that yeah. I'm wondering if they come up tonight, specifically the way that he has repeatedly said he's just not going to answer questions about if he believes that there should be more justices added to the Supreme Court. He said he's not going to answer that because he thinks it's a distraction. But that's something that Kamala Harris, when she was out on the campaign trail, she expressed an openness to. And so I'm right. wondering if cert certain loose threads like that are actually going to come up on the debate stage. Because when I think about Kamala Harris on the debate right. stage, we all watched her during the Democratic primary. She's strong on follow through. She's strong yeah. on preparation. Again, she's a prosecutor, right? But right. where she used to falter was in the follow through. She'd get back out on the campaign trail the next day and the positions would get a little muddier and a little bit foggier. Mm -hmm. The difference here is when right. she goes out to Arizona on the campaign trail tomorrow after the debate, she's doing so as a running mate, not the candidate. Right. And that might solve yeah. that problem. Right. Um, very quickly, Jeff Bennett, the president made a whole bunch of claims there. I just want to clarify things. Has his doctor put out a statement that he's cured? Has his doctor said he's virus free? Has his doctor said he's tested negative? No, he hasn't. His doctor has said none of those things. And we should also add that his doctor has not said when the president first tested negative. So we don't really right. know what his precise window of infection was and how many right. people uh, were exposed. And the, the infection count, both at the White House and the campaign, continues to go up, Chuck. That's for sure. Uh, Jeff and Allie, thank you both for getting us started on the ground in Utah. So let's look at where this race stands right now. Let me go over to Steve Kornacki at the big board. And Steve, we've been deluged with polls in the last 72 hours that paint a picture of this campaign that, frankly, we haven't seen in any presidential campaign in October since 1996. Right now, if all of these polls are taken in, 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 at once, it looks like it's over. What is happening? Yeah, seeing a candidate well over 50 percent, seeing these double digit leads. I mean, yeah, we had look, our NBC Wall Street Journal poll had it at 14. Our friends at CNN had it at 16. Those are some of the highest national numbers we've seen. But a bunch of others have come out, too. There's a Fox News poll tonight that has it at 10 points. So if you average together all the national polls that are out there right now, our NBC News poll average has Biden leading on average basically by 10 and a half points. And that is movement. The NBC poll polling average last week just before the debate was about eight. So that's two and a half points of movement in Biden's direction nationally in the national polls over the last week and again into double digits there. Now, where it gets a little complicated is when you go from the national level and you start taking a look at the battleground states. Let me show you what the picture looks like there. You see Biden leads top to bottom. And I should say that the battleground states that we're listing here, these are all battleground states where we have gotten polling post covid diagnosis post-debate last week. That's what you're looking at here. In some of these states, there's a few polls, and some of them, like Ohio, we've only gotten one. But you see Biden leads ranging from a point to eight and a half points. Pennsylvania, Michigan, six there in Wisconsin. Again, these are basically all Trump 2016 states, with the exception of Nevada. So you can sort of see there 10 point, 10 and a half point lead for Biden nationally. When you translate that to the swing states here, you've got Biden advantages, but some of them are close. It, it still remains the case if Trump could somehow, now we're saying five or six points, if the, the race moves five or six points in his direction, you can see how those swing states would start to fall pretty quickly into the Trump column. But at this point, it is clearly a big national lead for Joe Biden, and Biden is clearly ahead when it comes to the swing states. That's for sure. And just to clarify, uh, some of those states, we have multiple polls, and those are the average, right? Like, Correct. Because I've had a lot of people ask me about a certain poll out of Florida that shows 11 points. And let's just be frank, nobody believes the race is 11 points in Florida, but there's certainly possibly some movement in Florida. Fair? That's the thing. Yesterday, I was looking at a poll from USA Today, Suffolk in Florida, that had a tie. Today, we get a poll out from one pollster that has it at 11. Florida is yeah. one of those states, though, where I think we've had four or five since the weekend. So that's the average. The other one, by the way, people might be looking at here, Pennsylvania. There was the poll out this afternoon that had Pennsylvania double digits. We've had others that have it closer. So states like that, that's the average. But all of these, mm -hmm. all of these are polls only taken since the debate, since the diagnosis. So that's the picture you're looking at in those swing states. I, I, I'm asking you a question that I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to, but, but just to clarify, has any VP debate ever provided a bump? 
<laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll give you one on here. We put 88 when Bench sure. had absolutely crushed Quill and right. didn't, it didn't end up affecting yeah. that release. The one I wonder about is 2000 because Gore came into October of 2000 ahead of Bush, and Gore got a bunch of bad press coming out of his debate. And a few days later, there was the Cheney-Lieberman debate, and it was a day or two of coverage coming out of that that Cheney had done surprisingly well, that Lieberman wasn't what people had thought. And I think there was just a sequence there of about two weeks of really bad press for Gore collectively in October yeah. 2000 that All this right. contributed to. It's indirect, though. It's not like people right. are in the voting booth saying, you know, I really like the point Cheney made in that VP debate. No, but it's, you're right. It was the one-two punch. Lieberman didn't fix Gore's problem, right. and, and that and that um, that ended up uh, be, being a problem. Anyway, Steve Kornacki, thanks for getting us started, as you always, sir. It. So joining me now, Casey Hunt, NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent, my partner in crime in these events here, also host of Way Too Early Weekdays on MSNBC. Joshua Johnson, anchor of The Week with Joshua Johnson, Saturdays and Sundays on MSNBC, and NBC News presidential historian Michael Beschloss. Michael, I'm going to start with you because you and I had this conversation. Should this debate be happening in person tonight? No, it absolutely should not be happening in person, and I do not know why on earth that everyone agreed to this. This is dangerous. This is in the middle of a pandemic. You've got two small pieces of plexiglass. That's not going to protect anyone. And to subject the technicians in that studio, the reporters who are required to cover it, the aides to the two candidates, and these two possible future vice presidents and presidents to a life-threatening disease, I do not know why this is being done. As you know, Chuck, the third Kennedy-Nixon debate yep. in 1960 was done from New York and Luan at Los Angeles, it was a great debate. You know, Casey Hunt, I, I, you know, I thought we'd hear from the commission saying, you know, maybe we should propose a remote debate. I am surprised that this is not an issue. Chuck, I mean, I, I am too, honestly. I think a lot of people are. And, you know, P Vice President uh, Pence's campaign was pretty defiant even about the plexiglass, yeah. accused uh, Kamala Harris of you know, hiding herself behind a fortress. But, I mean, every day we're learning that there are more people that have tested positive for COVID-19 who are connected to the White House. And we know that uh, while the vice president has tested negative repeatedly, uh, you test negative until you don't anymore. That's how it works. Testing is not preventative. It just tells you uh, a little bit more information about how careful you need to be. So, I, I mean, it's clear both campaigns, uh, you know, wanted, didn't want to blink uh, in this right. situation. I don't think Harris's campaign wanted to either. I think they also uh, feel it's important to uh, demonstrate that they're, they're not afraid. But, you know, I think this really does What's set uh, Kamala Harris up in such a way from an editorial perspective, uh, you know, right. as she's going after uh, President, uh, Vice President Pence on the stage tonight. I mean, he is the leader of the coronavirus task force. And here they are with plexiglass because they weren't able to control an outbreak in their own White House. Yeah, Joshua Johnson, what kind of, I mean, I guess it is in some ways the, the entire setting and, and the moment we're in, boy, it, it's, quite the, it's quite the softball, if you will, for Kamala Harris, right? This is sort of exactly the terms you would want to have this debate. Yeah, the, the term's absent, of course, you know, the whole coronavirus issue in terms of I, keeping the candidates safe. Yes. Yeah, this is, right, yeah. this is kind of the I, only chance she's going to have to hit Mike Pence on this many things to his face for the entire campaign. So I can understand why this feels like it might be, from a purely strategic point of view, too good to pass up, especially because the president keeps making these unforced errors that right. give both the moderator and Kamala Harris tons to talk about. You know, the president said he's walking away from the table on COVID-19 negotiations or had said that right around right. the same time that the Fed chairman, Jerome Powell, said that the recovery of the economy depends on that. Tonight, the president tweeted that the remaining number of our brave men and women in Afghanistan will be home by Christmas. Today, the national security advisor, Robert O'Brien, said we should be down to about 5,000 by the end of this year, 2,500 next year maybe zero by May if the Taliban keep up their end of the peace deal. So there are all of these unforced errors that if I was Senator Harris, I, I would be memorizing the list of things that I wanted to just kind of mm -hmm. pillory Mike Pence about the head and shoulders for and just ask him, like, do we want four more years of your boss? Do you right. really want to work for this guy for another four years? It, it just feels like 
there, there is so much to play with tonight if Kamala Harris decides to go for the throat that covert or not, just from a competitive standpoint, it's kind of too good to pass up. Well, and that's the question I think that some people have about, and, let, and I want to put up, let me play, you know, her probably her biggest moment during the primary debates. Um, let me play that clip because I'm curious to see what you guys think of, of how aggressive she might try to be tonight. Take a look. Now, I'm going to now direct this at Vice President Biden. Um, I do not believe you are a racist. And I agree with you when you commit yourself to the importance of finding common ground. Mm -hmm. But I also believe, and it is personal, and I was actually very, it was hurtful to hear you talk about the reputations of two United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. And it was not only that, but you also worked with them to oppose busing. And, you know, there was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools. And she was bused to school every day. And that little girl was me. So, Michael Betchloss, I remember when that moment happened, you're like, whoa. I mean, I remember I said <laughs> it, it was a sit up moment. It was a, a right. wow. Uh, she took it to him and it was well crafted. It was well prepared, but it didn't seem it didn't seem scripted. Um, what do you take away from that? And and how aggressive do you I, I, Joshua sets it up? There's so many opportunities, but there's also probably the Biden campaign going, do no harm, do no harm, do no harm. We're up, we're up double digits. What do you expect, Michael? I, I totally agree with you, Chuck. Uh, she's a great prosecutor. She has enormous performance skills as a political leader that we will see on display tonight. And at the same time, you've got, just as you were saying, Joe Biden has got, if we can believe these polls, a big lead right now. And for her to do something risky tonight would only jeopardize that. You've got two presidential candidates who are among the oldest ever to run for president in American life. One of them, President Trump, has a life-threatening illness. The, vice, the office of vice president has a lot more meaning tonight. She is less known. She's trying to get people to feel comfortable with her as a vice president and a potential president. Bob yeah. Dole is one negative example. 1976, right. he complained about Democrat wars. Dan Quayle is the other, 1988, when Lloyd Benson said, you're no Jack Kennedy. He looked like a deer in the headlights. The Bush right. quail ticket won, but it wrecked quail's national career. So, Casey Hunt, what do you what do you what do you expect from Kamala Harris? You've seen her in the Senate. You've seen her at these hearings. How aggressive do you expect her to be tonight? Well, Chuck, I, I think that you've got it right when you point out that the Biden campaign wants to do no harm. And, you know, I think the challenge here for Kamala Harris is going to be finding a sweet spot between her kind of natural comfort level and instincts where you know, mm -hmm. she is very good when she's prepared to do something at going and, and making those those sharp attacks. But from what we've seen about how the campaign's preparing, I mean, we've seen stories about how they're looking at um, women and, and polling about right. how women are received differently on the debate stage. I mean, that says that they're very aware of how she is going to come across uh, to Americans who are meeting her for the first time. And she has, you know, one of her one of her strengths, I think, has always been that she has been able to go after, whether it's her opponents on the debate stage or whether it's questioning a witness in a judiciary hearing, she comes across in a way that, you know, I don't, I don't want to say that she delivers these attacks with a smile because, you know, you can very quickly get into gendered territory. No, but, right. you know, she comes across as a very, um, you know, as, as somebody who you're open to liking, quite frankly. Uh, and, yeah. and, and again, this is, this is very difficult territory to tread on. But it is something that I think is a strength of hers that she's brought to the table. But, you know, my question is, this is going to be the, the, the biggest stage of her career yeah. um, and simply whether she's able to strike to strike that balance uh, yeah. in a way that sort of protects what the Biden campaign wants and also plays to her natural strengths, if that makes sense. It does. And Casey, you're hinting at and Joshua, I think you, 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 you know exactly what Casey's trying to say here, which is. I think there's a lot of us that think that whether it's fair or not, Kamala Harris is getting judged on, 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 on levels that 
that Mike Pence won't be. But to pick up on something Casey said there, I do think actually this is something both Kamala Harris and Mike Pence are effective at doing. They can go in, they can hit you hard, you didn't know it was coming. Mm -hmm. You know, there is this, they, they carry themselves both in a, I think a sunnier demeanor is probably, they both have that ability and it's gonna be interesting to watch the two of them that way tonight. There are more savvy orators than most, I think, yeah. you know, in, in yeah. that regard. Uh, we had a debate coach on the week this weekend who talked about <laughs> just the way that having them seated next to one another rather than standing at podiums might play that might deal with some of that stereotype that Casey mentioned in terms of women being perceived as aggressive. I think a better word for Kamala Harris than aggressive is incisive. Mm. She's an incisive speaker. I don't know anybody who can watch her at the Judiciary Committee and say that she's ever been shrill or loud or, you know, harsh. She's just got a line of questions that she has already sharp. prepared. She, feel, she feels like she feels like yeah. my mom. When she, well, I know I'm wrong, when she's like, come get your beaten, <laughs> you know what you did. Nope. The thing where she went after Joe Biden in Miami, it almost yeah. felt like someone saying, we didn't raise you to be this way. You know mm -hmm. better. You, you know, know these better. aren't your yeah. values. And you did something that defies your values. And I'm not going to let you walk away without speaking to that. That's not aggressive. That's right. incisive and principled. And I think if she can let that come across, then that line of questioning about all the things that Mike Pence's yeah. boss is doing could end up being highly effective tonight. Just so folks know, we've got a Mike Pence debate clip that we will play and also break down the next time you guys come on the air here. But I've got to sneak in a quick break. So Casey, Joshua, and Michael, stay with us. Up ahead, with 27 days to go, some voters really are still undecided. We'll hear from some of them about what they hope to take away from tonight's event. But first, all this hour, we'll be sharing memorable moments from past vice presidential debates. There's quite a few really great ones. We're going to start back in 1976, when Walter Mondale sparred with Bob Dole and gave him a name that stuck. World War II or World War I? of the war in Korea, all Democrat wars, all in this century. I figured up the other day, if we added up the killed and wounded in Democrat wars in this century, it'd be about 1.6 million Americans, enough to fill the city of Detroit. I think uh, Senator Dole has richly earned his reputation as a hatchet man tonight by implying and stating that World War II and the Korean War were Democratic wars. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. 
A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Welcome back. Even after last week's presidential debate and the months of campaigning leading up to it, we can still find voters that are uh, undecided, we swear. If indecisive voters were looking to base their decision off of policy, well, last week's debate was not the most illuminating for that. We get that. You didn't hear any policy. That combined with the chance that this has the potential to be the last debate of the campaign season, we say could because of all the COVID issues with the president. So if this is the last debate, period, becomes pretty consequential, even more so than the previous debate. So MSNBC senior national correspondent Chris Jansen talked to some undecided voters in Flagstaff, Arizona. So, Chris, what are you hearing? I assume the one thing they don't want is yelling and spitting like last week. <laughs> Boy, did you call it. You, you phrased it very nicely. They had some sort of more forceful words about it. But yeah. look. This is really another instance, Chuck, where what we thought we knew about politics in 2020 gets turned on its head. I mean, not only are undecided voters telling me that tonight's debate matters, but that it could be decisive. L let that sink in for a minute. A vice presidential debate that could help them decide finally who to vote for. I mean, look, I, I guess there have been clues. I've been going around talking in a lot of different states to undecided voters. They've been bringing up both of the presidential candidates' health and age, and now you add the president getting COVID, and it kind of adds this new layer of what if. So we yeah. sat down here in Flagstaff with a couple of guys in their mid-20s, a working mom. She's got a six-year-old and a seven-year-old. And I asked the question that I think a lot of people out there are asking right now. How are you still undecided? Take a listen. <laughs> I don't have anything that I feel resonates with me personally. Also, our candidates this time around, um, they're a lot older. But what the vice president's debate has to say can really impact my decision on Biden. Most likely he might do one term only. You know, at this point, the VP does matter a lot because they have a lot more of a different take on politics than what these, I don't want to say old guys, but the... <laughs> I guess I'll say old guys. What, what <laughs> the old guys have to offer. Krishan, how closely will you be watching? A lot closer than the presidential debate, because I kind of expected it to be a joke. <laughs> Who thought the presidential debate was a joke? More or less. It was less. more, more like a mess. mess, yeah. I, I don't know if it was a joke, but it was, it was really it was hard to... Like mostly taking jabs at each other, you know? Like, yeah, no it really was really hard to pay attention it. because there was just so much going on. So what will you look for in the vice presidential debate? I'm taking it more seriously. I'm definitely looking into a VP that's strong, at least have a strong presence. That would most definitely put me where I, who I want to vote for. I don't really care about how old they are or what they look like, as long as they take it a little more seriously, like, so I get an <laughs> idea what they actually care about would be nice. So what does it mean to take it seriously? They want a plan. They want them to answer the questions and have a plan for how to deal with coronavirus and the economic impact. To your first point, like this might be the last debate, Chuck, they kind of shrug their shoulders a little bit they're not even sure they'd watch another presidential debate. That's how low they thought the first one was. And again, they think yeah. tonight could decide for them. And we're all set up in this backyard to watch it all together, Chuck. So there you go. Well, I look forward to the report post-debate. That's for sure. Chris Jansing in Flagstaff, Arizona for us. Chris, thank you. So tonight, as we've said, Kamala Harris will be tasked with defending a record other than her own for the first time. She made a name for herself by her own tough questioning in Senate judiciary hearings and memorable performances in primary debates. But tonight, she will need to showcase that signature strength without turning the spotlight on herself as much. 
It's not an easy task for anybody. Here with some insight is her longtime friend uh, from the Bay Area, California Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Congresswoman Lee, it's uh, good to have you here. So um, what are you expecting from your friend, Senator Harris, tonight? Well, first, uh, Senator Harris, I know, is going to be herself, and she's going to talk directly to the American people. And uh, she, uh, first of all, will put forth their agenda in terms of the uh, Biden-Harris agenda and how they're going to tackle this COVID-19 pandemic immediately. 211,000 people have died. 30 million people have lost their jobs. Millions have the virus. And this is due to the lack of leadership of Donald Trump and the head of this COVID task force, Vice President Pence. So she's got to make him answer to their lack of leadership and what happened and why. And then secondly, she's going to really talk about how they're going to help with economic growth, building back better in terms of creating good paying jobs so that everyone will have a path out of this uh, economic uh, disaster. It's thirdly, uh, Senator Harris has always been one who tries to find common ground. And so she's not going to let Vice President Pence try to divide us uh, by mm -hmm. his misrepresentation and his lies. She's going to put forth uh, a presentation and part of her debate to help bring people together and unify this country so that we can move forward and regain the soul of America. You, one of your points just now was on the economy. And I've heard this from other congressional Democrats uh, who have said, if there is one, and they don't want to, they're, they're careful not to use the word critique, but if there is one issue that they wish the Biden-Harris campaign would be more aggressive on is, don't let this perception that somehow Trump built an economy um, remind, remind people of the Obama-Biden role in the economic recovery um, because there's this, they, they believe, these Democrats believe that I've talked to, it will help sort of uh, appease folks that aren't sure now about who could best handle the economy. Sure, and let me just say, I uh, was um, part of uh, the congressional, of course, I've been in Congress since 98. And so as a member of Congress, when the Obama-Biden uh, administration took over, I saw it how hard Vice President Biden worked to pass the Recovery Act. That bill, those resources, which we wanted uh, a trillion, it came out to, I think, 900 or 800, no, excuse me, 740 billion, I believe. But I saw wow. how no Republicans worked and voted for that. I saw how hard they tried to work in a bipartisan way to bring Republicans around so that we could move forward and have a recovery that was strong and that was robust. And in fact, we did have that recovery. It was not up, uh, it was not left to the Republicans in Congress. It was Joe Biden and President Obama who moved forward and saved this country from going into a deep depression and created jobs, which of course, when Donald Trump took over the economic recovery, he tried to claim credit for, but this has a, is a result of President Obama and Vice President Biden making sure that the recovery touched everyone. Right. I'm curious, do you think it's safe to have this debate in person tonight? Well, you know, the Cleveland Clinic and all of the health professionals and, and medical experts and scientists have established protocols for these debates. Uh, I'm, you know, worried in many ways for the workers there and people mm -hmm. who uh, are participating, even in the audience, that, uh, you know, the health protocols, excuse me, that everyone will comply with the health protocols. I don't think us as uh, lay people can talk about or, or make a judgment on the, what, has, what the recommendations have been, but I certainly want to see every single precaution taken because uh, this White House, under the leadership of mm -hmm. <laughs> Donald Trump and Vice President Biden, have been totally irresponsible and have because of their irresponsibility, so many people have died and so many people have lost, lost their jobs and so many people have contracted the virus. So I'd be very careful. Uh, and I'm glad that they are being very careful. Well, let me ask you this about, we know that relief talks, I guess are stalled, but if you, the president's Twitter feed implies that maybe there's talking 
Um, do you think there is some bipartisan deal to be had before the election, or or is this is it too late? No, it's never too late. And the American people, many are living on the edge, and we need to get the Republicans to negotiate fairly. I mean, we passed the heroes, the first heroes bill over three months ago. Last week, we passed the Heroes Act, which included additional funds for testing, contact tracing, referral for isolation and medical care. We passed legislation that created uh, a path for state and local governments to not have to lay off essential workers who provide essential services. We've put into that bill more PPE, more money for our small businesses. And we have been trying, and Leader uh, Speaker Pelosi has done a phenomenal job in helping to negotiate what's realistic and what the American people live, lead, need. Excuse me. This bill started, we were over uh, $3 trillion. She came down to a little over $2 trillion. So she's mm -hmm. come halfway. And for the life of me, I don't understand what the game plan is with this president. I mean, it's very no, erratic. I don't get it. It's yeah. irresponsible. And they should have voted last week <laughs> for the HEROES Act. Look, uh, politically, no matter which side of the aisle, not doing this before the election is a head scratcher, that's for sure. Anyway, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Democrat from Oakland, California, uh, it's good to get your perspective on here. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Good being with you. Good seeing you, Todd. Thank you very much. All right. Up ahead, this debate is happening in a moment of real peril for the Trump campaign. But first, let's go back to 1992 when Ross Perot's running mate, Admiral James Stockdale, had two very simple, if rhetorical, questions for all of us to consider. Admiral Stockdale, your opening statement, please, sir. Who am I? Why am I here? <laughs> I'm not a politician, everybody knows that. So don't expect me to use the language of the Washington Insider. 37 years in the Navy, and only one of them up there in Washington. And now I'm an academic. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I gonna decide, take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. 
with all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. My name is Patrick Morning. Welcome back. We are less than a half hour from the start of the vice presidential debate. You're looking live here at the stage in Salt Lake City. With me now are Charlie Sykes, editor at large of The Bulwark and an MSNBC contributor, and Donna Edwards, former Democratic congresswoman from Maryland, and now an MSNBC contributor and a Washington Post contributing columnist. So, um, Donna Edwards, let me start with you. What, what, what don't you want to see from Kamala Harris tonight? Well, I mean, I think that it's important for her to make sure that this isn't about her. This is about uh, turning around the debate and the argument to the failed uh, Trump presidency, Trump-Pence uh, presidency. And I think that she will do that. Um, I think that, you know, I, you know I, I guess because I know that Kamala Harris is a, is a pro former prosecutor, uh, that she's a United States senator, I don't expect her to lose her cool. And so that would be uncharacteristic. And, um, you know, and I think that, you know, I, I don't want to see her um, focus this debate about the past and about, you know, where she was in the primary campaign. I think it's going to be important for her right. to turn all of those questions back in uh, to what really is on stage, and that is the failed uh, presidency of the Trump-Pence administration. You know, Charlie, I was thinking, I can't ask you the same question about Mike Pence. What don't you want to see for Mike Pence tonight? But I guess, because he, to me, has a, um, a unique challenge in that he's got to defend some things over the last 72 hours that most people would find impossible to defend. What do you do? Well, we're going to find out. Look, um, I wouldn't underestimate Mike Pence. He's actually, I think, an underrated debater. He used to uh, to do this for a living. He was a talk show host. Uh, we haven't seen much of it in the last four years, where he's basically, you know, played the the the, the potted plant. But um, he'll he'll do the best job playing the cards dealt that he can. But the cards that he's been dealt are just horrible. Oh my. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the fact that he's standing there behind plexiglass shields. I mean, the symbolism of that. For somebody who uh, you know led the coronavirus task force, look, um, Donald Trump and and Mike Pence wanted to be talking about the economy. They wanted to be talking about law and order and critical late race theory and how Cory Booker is going to destroy uh, the, the suburbs. Instead, we're right uh, smack back on the coronavirus and the failed handling of all of that. Not to mention the bizarre and erratic behavior of the president. So right. um, I, I I think. You know, look, Mike Pence has is, is been somewhat underrated in, I think, this debate, mm -hmm. but he has a tremendously difficult task uh, tonight. You know, Don Edwards, it was it, it it's interesting to me about to watch to watch this in that in the last week after the first debate, it looks like this race has taken a decided turn. So I guess the question is, how do you avoid becoming complacent? Well, I mean, the Democrats that I talk to, frankly, because of the experience of 2016, are so far away from complacent. I mean, they are, you know, continuing the phone calls. Um, they are talking to their supporters. They're, you know, encouraging people to vote early. I don't really feel that kind of complacency. If anything, uh, what I hear from the campaign is that they're approaching it as though they're running behind. And I know that mm -hmm. sounds odd, given uh, the poll numbers, but nobody's really looking at that. They're looking at the mechanics of what they have to do in these next 27 days uh, to bring this uh, to a close. And I think tonight in this vice presidential debate, I, I think given that it may be the last debate, there may be a lot more pressure on mm -hmm. Kamala Harris and Mike Pence uh, both to defend, uh, for Pence to defend the record of the, the uh, president and also for Kamala Harris to make sure that she is really clear about what a Biden-Harris administration will bring and what that will mean for the American people. And I think that you can expect her to take the approach that Joe Biden did in that uh, debate that seems like 100 years ago, where right. 
he actually spoke directly to the American people. And I bet you you're going to see the same yeah. kind of thing uh, from Kamala Harris. I tell you, it showed up in our focus groups uh, on Meet the Press on Sunday. One of the one of the people said they really liked how Biden would look at the camera. And you're like, boy, when a focus group respondent says that, um, that I'm guessing will uh, tell a lot of candidates something. Charlie Sykes, um, do you think that do you think the president's behavior today is uh, what happens when you see multiple national polls showing double digits, even your favorite pollster Rasmussen decided to match match their numbers with where the rest of the rest of the polls are showing. Um, is that what we're seeing with the president's behavior? Well, look, um, it, it's not just one poll. It, it looks like the this is a presidency in free fall. Um, he's vulnerable everywhere. He's hemorrhaging among women. He's hemorrhaging among senior citizens. Um, he's having to pull back from some of the Midwestern battleground states. So are we seeing panic? Or, look, I don't want to play a doctor or a pharmacist on the air here, Chuck, but um, mm -hmm. this is bizarre behavior, and I do think We're it's legitimate to ask whether or not— you know, this president who is uh, jacked up on experimental medicines, including steroids, is playing it out. But here's the problem. How do you know if, you know, D Donald Trump is behaving in a particularly erratic manner? Is there anything new about that? But it is concerning when you see the president of the United States who is tweeting, what, uh, more than 50 times in a period of 12 hours, all in caps, uh, one tweet more bizarre than the other. So right. it's been a very, very, very strange 24 hours. And there are so many questions that we need answers to that we haven't gotten answers right. to. Look, when mania is a side effect of one of the drugs he's on, you can't help but have it in the back of your head when you see this, these tweet storms. Yeah. Anyway, Charlie Sykes, Donna Edwards, thank you both. Uh, our panel is back right after the break. But first, let's throw back to a more familiar 2008 debate moment when Alaska Governor Sarah Palin was suddenly on a first name basis with the senator from Delaware who was the Democratic nominee for vice president, Joe Biden. Nice to meet you. Hey, can I call you Joe? These people know the middle class has gotten the short end. The wealthy have done very well. Corporate America has been rewarded some time. We change it. Barack Obama will change it. Governor. Ah, say it ain't so, Joe. There you go again, pointing backwards again. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. Got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story 
Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in depth. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. I just want to talk about the tone that's set from the top. Donald Trump during his campaign has called Mexicans rapists and criminals. He's called women slobs, pigs, dogs, disgusting. I don't like saying that in front of my wife and my mother. Just, again, I cannot believe that Governor Pence will defend the insult-driven campaign that Donald Trump has run. Uh, he, he says <laughs> ours is an, an, an insult-driven campaign. Did you all just hear that? Ours is an insult-driven campaign. I mean, to be honest with you, if Donald Trump had said all the things that you said he said in the way you said he said them, he still wouldn't have a fraction of the insults that Hillary Clinton leveled when she said that half of our supporters were a basket of deplorables. Welcome back. As I promised at the top of the show, that was uh, then-Governor Mike Pence parrying an attack from Hillary Clinton's running mate. Senator Tim Kaine at the VP debate in 2016. My NBC News colleagues are still with me. Casey Hunt, Joshua Johnson, Michael Beschloss. Well, as I promised and promoted, we broke down, I guess, <laughs> some debate tape of Kamala Harris. So now we're breaking down some debate tape of Mike Pence. Joshua, we'll start with you because it sort of gets at what we stopped talking about at the end there, which is the ability to, to basically hit, hit back, hit back hard, but do it with, uh, do it with a sunny disposition, disposition I guess. Yeah, and that's the that's the interesting thing. I'm 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 going to be interested to see how hard Senator Harris feels that she needs to hit. Also, how hard the vice president feels that he needs to hit, considering that there is so much piling up to yeah. make the vice president answer for, particularly coronavirus. Just within the last few minutes, I should note, NBC News has confirmed that a, the head of the White House security office has tested positive for COVID, a man named Creed Bailey. We've not independently confirmed. Is this number 19? Is this number 19 Maybe now or 20? 20. 19 yeah. or 20, yeah. And now, NBC News has not independently confirmed when he got sick or how sick he is. But this is yet another thing that Kamala Harris doesn't need to hit Mike Pence for. She just needs right. to say it. There's just a number of things that you can just say. All right. We have, you had 30 days to stop the spread that didn't stop the spread because your boss undermined it. Within the last few hours, another news organization has confirmed someone inside your White House has gotten sick. Right. The economy is in free fall. Your president is saying different things than your national security advisor about bringing the troops home. We've got issues with our standing on the world stage. Why should we hire you for another four years yeah. and let that question sit? I don't know that tone may even matter that much in this yeah. debate, as long as she doesn't, you know, drop an F-bomb on national TV. She's got enough ammunition. Well, it was interesting to see the full back and forth between Kane and Pence there, Michael Beschloss, yes. because yes. Um, I don't expect Kamala Harris to go that hard at Donald, at, at Donald Trump tonight that Tim Kane did then. I think it's a reminder of some of the concerns the Clinton Kane ticket had back then about landing, landing some of these uh, punches on the Trump campaign. I think that's right, Chuck. And, you know, if you're a candidate who's looking at the Clint, at the Kane pence debate for pointers, the lesson of Tim Kaine's performance is wonderful senator, right. lovely man. He I was did. never cut out to be a, an attack dog. And the Clinton people told him, you've got to go in and basically, you know, behave like Richard Nixon or someone like Bob Dole, who's used to doing this. And he was not, he was out of character. And as a result, Mike Pence, I think, won that debate. And so I think no one should underestimate Pence's ability at doing that. But now not, uh, he's coming into this not as the Indiana governor, but as the head of Donald Trump's coronavirus task force, lots of luck. 
Well, and Michael Beschloss, you know, watching that, I, I was struck by watching Tim Kaine's face as Mike Pence kind of tried to take that attack and turn it around on him. And I, I wonder, because I certainly know a lot of, of us have watched Mike Pence over the years. And, you know, I've, I covered him starting when he was in Congress. He thought about running for president back uh, in 2012. Uh, he was someone that we all always took very seriously. And I think right. a lot of people have been a little bit incredulous watching him defend Donald Trump because it sometimes seems so at odds with the, the politician that, that we feel like we used to know. Right. But at the same time, he does deliver those lines with a completely straight face. I mean, what is the task in front of Harris in terms of just trying to keep, whether it's her cool or her face straight? Or, I mean, what do you think is the imperative for her tonight? She's an excellent prosecutor. She's going to be able to make the case against Donald Trump very effectively. And as I was saying earlier, she does this in a way that I think is very appealing to people when it looks, dare I say this, very presidential. But not to underestimate Mike Pence. You know, you, Casey, have Midwestern relatives, so do I. I grew up in Illinois. And one thing you learn when you're running for office in Illinois or, or Michigan or Indiana, which I did not, is and I think you would vouch for this, to be able to prosecute and make the case against the opponent, but to do it in sort of a nice way. And Pence can do that. And oddly enough, although Kamala Harris is not from Illinois, she can too. Yes, I, I mean, I think we, we've definitely gotten a taste of that. Um, Joshua Johnson, quickly, we haven't touched on, on the fact that, um, you know, Kamala Harris is making history uh, tonight as a, a, a black woman who is standing on that stage uh, with uh, the vice president, Mike Pence. What do you think this means? I mean, we've seen so many pictures of her sorority sisters, for example, uh, from Howard University, but also from across the country. What does it mean to them tonight to see her do this? I think it means being able to see yourself reflected in America in ways like you've never seen reflected before, to see someone with poise and dignity and credential and experience, uh, and who, by the way, I'm not suggesting might actually say, an F-bomb on TV. That was just a for instance. But someone who comes with an amazing Noted. pedigree. And, we we and didn't hear that. Clear. Exactly. And who also just lets people know that they're seen. I think in a year where we've been talking so much about racial justice, when we are considering re-electing the original birther, having right. a black woman speak right. to the vice president of that man represents, yeah. I think, for at least her supporters, the America of right. today, and yeah. the possible America of tomorrow. That's going to be a real turning point in itself, regardless of who wins. Right. An absolutely great point. Joshua, I'm so sorry, but we've got to go. Joshua Johnson, Michael Beschloss, thank you so much. NBC News coverage of the vice presidential debate between Mike Pence and Kamala Harris From continues NBC right News, now. NBC News, the vice presidential debate. Here are Lester Holt and Savannah Guthrie. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our coverage of the 2020 vice presidential debate. Republican incumbent Mike Pence and Democratic challenger Kamala Harris facing off in their sole matchup with the election now just 27 days away. And a lot has happened happened in the eight days since the last debate, very contentious presidential debate. President Trump, the first lady, and many top aides have now tested positive for the coronavirus. The president was hospitalized for several days, so the pandemic is certain to be center stage tonight. And that's going to be evident on the stage itself at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, where plexiglass barriers have been installed between the candidates as an added safety measure. Tonight's moderator is USA Today Washington Bureau Chief Susan Page. The debate commission says she will not be responsible for fact-checking the candidates, but our team of correspondents and analysts are standing by. And for real-time fact-checking, you can go to NBCNews.com. So let's get it started. NBC's Jeff Bennett inside the debate hall tonight in Salt Lake City, Utah. Jeff, what are you hearing from the campaigns? Hey, Savannah, good evening. It is impossible to overstate the degree to which the coronavirus pandemic has transformed this vice presidential debate, starting with President Trump recovering from the virus at the White House. No vice president has ever debated while a president is known to be ill. And of course, the pandemic also stretches to the stage behind me. You've got the 12 feet of space between the candidates, the plexiglass partitions. And when it comes to what we might expect the candidates themselves to say tonight, I'm told by a Biden campaign official that they don't necessarily expect 
Senator Harris to spar with Mike Pence, that her goal is to aim higher, to prosecute the case against President Trump as she sees it, and to lay out a contrasting vision for America. Vice President Mike Pence's goal, I'm told, is to help the Trump campaign, one of his goals anyway, is to help the Trump campaign gain ground, both with those key groups of voters and in those battleground states where President Trump right now is underperforming. But look, in Senator Harris and in the vice president, you have two seasoned, skilled debaters, two longtime public servants. This should be a very substantive debate. All right, Jeff, thanks. Let's turn to NBC News political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd. Chuck, Mike Pence may have a tough hill to climb tonight. He does. Look, I do think this debate will be more polite, which I think everybody watching will appreciate that. But yes, I think the vice president uh, has a tougher hill to climb than he already had. Um, number one, forget last week's debate. How about everything that has happened in the last 48 hours from the president's diagnosis? He's the head of the task force, and the president walked away from relief talks. I don't know how he can get off of the virus. That's his challenge tonight. But let me turn to NBC's senior Washington correspondent, Andrea Mitchell, for the flip side of that, which is, yes, Mike Pence is the head of the task force, which means he knows this issue inside and out. If anyone can defend the case for the administration, this is the, the, the one who can do it. Except that he is the head of the task force, which has been so widely criticized for its conduct through for months and months. So I think he will be on the defense if he's a very experienced debater, a former talk show host, and he will he'll be polite, polite in going after Harris as well as Joe Biden. They are both skilled debaters, as we said, and this debate is about to get underway. Let's turn it over to tonight's moderator, Susan Page. Good evening. From the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, welcome to the first and only vice presidential debate of 2020, sponsored by the Nonpartisan Commission on Presidential Debates. I'm Susan Page of USA Today. It is my honor to moderate this debate, an important part of our democracy. In Kingsbury Hall tonight, we have a small and socially distant audience, and we've taken extra precautions during this pandemic. Among other things, everyone in the audience is required to wear a face mask, and the candidates will be seated 12 feet apart. The audience is enthusiastic about their candidates, but they've agreed to express that enthusiasm only twice, at the end of the debate, and now, when I introduce the candidates. Please welcome California Senator Kamala Harris and Vice President Mike Pence. Thank you. Senator Harris and Vice President Pence, thank you for being here. We're meeting as President Trump and the First Lady continue to undergo treatment in Washington after testing positive for COVID-19. We send our thoughts and prayers to them for their rapid and complete recovery and for the recovery of everyone afflicted by the coronavirus. The two campaigns and the Commission on Presidential Debates have agreed to the ground rules for tonight. I'm here to enforce them on behalf of the millions of Americans who are watching. One note, no one in either campaign or at the commission or anywhere else has been told in advance what topics I'll raise or what questions I'll ask. This 90-minute debate will be divided into nine segments of about 10 minutes each. I'll begin a segment by posing a question to each of you, sometimes the same question, sometimes a different question on the same topic. You will then have two minutes to answer without interruption by me or the other candidate. Then we'll take six minutes or so to discuss the issue. At that point, although there will always be more to say, we'll move on to the next topic. We want a debate that is lively, but Americans also deserve a discussion that is civil. These are tumultuous times, but we can and will have a respectful exchange about the big issues facing our nation. Let's begin with the ongoing pandemic that has cost our country so much. Senator Harris, the coronavirus is not under control. Over the past week, Johns Hopkins reports that 39 states have had more COVID cases over the past seven days than in the week before. Nine states have set new records. 
Even if a vaccine is released soon, the next administration will face hard choices. What would a Biden administration do in January and February that a Trump administration wouldn't do? Would you impose new lockdowns for businesses and schools and hotspots, a federal mandate to wear masks? You have two minutes to respond without interruption. Thank you, Susan. Well, the American people have witnessed what is the greatest failure of any presidential administration in the history of our country. And here are the facts. 210,000 dead people in our country in just the last several months. Over 7 million people who have contracted this disease. One in five businesses closed. We're looking at frontline workers who have been treated like sacrificial workers. We are looking at over 30 million people who in the last several months had to file for unemployment. And here's the thing. On January 28th, the vice president and the president were informed about the nature of this pandemic. They were informed that it's lethal in consequence, that it is airborne, that it will affect young people, and that it would be contracted because it is airborne. And they knew what was happening, and they didn't tell you. Can you imagine if you knew on January 28th, as opposed to March 13th, what they knew, what you might have done to prepare? They knew, and they covered it up. The president said it was a hoax. They minimize the seriousness of it. The president said, you're on one side of his ledger. If you wear a mask, you're on the other side of his ledger if you don't. And in spite of all of that, today they still don't have a plan. They still don't have a plan. Well, Joe Biden does. And our plan is about what we need to do around a national strategy for contact tracing, for testing, for administration of the vaccine, and making sure that it will be free for all. That is the plan that Joe Biden has and that I have, knowing that we have to get a hold of what has been going on, and we need to save our country. And Joe Biden is the best leader to do that. And frankly, this administration Thank has forfeited Thank you, their right Harris. to reelection based Th on this. Thank you, Senator Harris. Vice President Pence, more than 210,000 Americans have died of COVID-19 since February. The U.S. death toll as a percentage of our population is higher than that of almost every other wealthy nation on Earth. For instance, our death rate is two and a half times that of Canada next door. You head the administration's coronavirus task force. Why is the U.S. death toll as a percentage of our population higher than that of almost every other wealthy country? And you have two minutes to respond without interruption. Susan, thank you. And I want to thank the commission and the University of Utah for hosting this event, and uh, Senator Harris, it's a privilege to be on the stage with you. And our nation has gone through a very challenging time this year. But I want the American people to know that from the very first day, President Donald Trump has put the health of America first. Before, there were more than five cases in the United States, all people who had returned from China. President Donald Trump did what no other American president had ever done, and that was he suspended all travel from China, the second largest economy in the world. Now, Senator Joe Biden, Biden opposed that decision. He said it was xenophobic and hysterical. But I can tell you, having led the White House Coronavirus Task Force, that that decision alone by President Trump bought us invaluable time to stand up the greatest national mobilization since World War II. And I believe it saved hundreds of thousands of American lives. Because with that time, we were able to reinvent testing. More than 115 million tests have been done to date. We were able to see to the delivery of billions of supplies so our doctors and nurses had the resources support they needed. And we began, really, before the month of February was our, to develop a vaccine and to develop medicines and therapeutics that had been saving lives all along the way. And under President Trump's leadership, Operation Warp Speed, we believe, will have literally tens of millions of doses of a vaccine before the end of this year. The reality is, when you look at the Biden plan, it reads an awful lot like what President Trump and I and our task force have been doing every step of the way. I mean, quite frankly, when I look at their plan that talks about advancing testing, creating new PPE, developing a vaccine, um, 
It looks a little bit like plagiarism, which is something Joe Biden knows a little bit about. And I think the American people know that this is a president who has put the Thank health you, of Vice America president. first, and the American people, I believe with my heart, can be Thank proud of the sacrifices Pence. they have made. It saved Thank countless you, American Pence. lives. Senator Harris, would oh, you like to respond? Absolutely. I, whatever the vice president is claiming the administration has done, clearly it hasn't worked. When you're looking at over 210,000 dead bodies in our country, American lives that have been lost, families that are grieving that loss. And, you know, the vice president is the head of the task force and knew on January 28th how serious this was. And then, thanks to Bob Woodward, we learned that they knew about it. And then, when that was exposed, the vice president said, when asked, well, why didn't you all tell anybody? He said, because the president wanted people to remain calm. Well, let's get so to No, but Susan, I, this is important. Susan, I, and I, I, I want to add, but if, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. I have to I'm speaking. Yeah, you can so have 15 I, I, I more wanna, seconds, and then we'll give the vice president a you. chance to So respond. I want to ask the American people, how calm were you when you were panicked about where you're going to get your next roll of toilet paper? How calm were you when your kids were sent home from school and you didn't know when they could go back? How calm Thank were you, you Thank when you, your Senator children Harris. couldn't see your parents because you were afraid they could kill them? And let's give Vice President Pence a chance to respond. Vice President Pence, you have one minute to respond. You know, there's not a day gone by that I haven't thought of every American family that's lost a loved one. And I want all of you to know that you'll always be in our hearts and in our prayers. But when you say what the American people have done over these last eight months hasn't worked, that's a great disservice to the sacrifices the American people have made. I'm afraid the reality, if I, may, if I may finish, Senator, the reality is Dr. Fauci said everything that he told the president in the Oval Office, the president told the American people. Now, President Trump, I will tell you, has boundless confidence in the American people, and he always spoke with confidence that we'd get through this together. But when you say it hasn't worked, when Dr. Fauci and Dr. Birx and our medical experts came to us in the second week of March, they said if the president didn't take the unprecedented step of shutting down roughly half of the American economy, that we could lose 2.2 million Americans. Now, that's the reality. Thank you. They also Thank said to us President if we did everything right, Susan, we could still lose more than 200,000 Americans. Vice President now, one Pence. life lost is Thank too you. many, Susan. But the American people, I believe, deserve credit for the sacrifices that they have made, putting the health of their family and their neighbors first, our doctors, our nurses, our first Thank responders. Thank you, Vice President Pence. And I'm going to speak up on behalf of what the American people have done. Vice President Pence, you were in the front row in a Rose Garden event 11 days ago, what seems to have been a super spreader event for senior administration and congressional officials. No social distancing, few masks, and now a cluster of coronavirus cases among those who were there. How can you expect Americans to follow the administration's safety guidelines to protect themselves from COVID when you at the White House have not been doing so? Well, the American people have demonstrated over the last eight months that when given the facts, they're willing to put the health of their families and their neighbors and people they don't even know first. And President Trump and I have great confidence in, in the American people and, and their ability to take that information and put it into practice. In the height of the epidemic, when we were losing a heartbreaking number of 2,500 Americans a day, we surged resources to New Jersey and New York and New Orleans and Detroit. We told the American people what needed to be done, and the American people made the sacrifices. When the outbreak in the Sun Belt happened this summer, again, Americans stepped forward. But the reality is the work of the President of the United States goes on. A vacancy on the Supreme Court of the United States uh, has come upon us, and the president introduced Judge Amy Coney yes. Barrett. Thank you. Thank you, Vice but President. At, at yes. that, if I may say, that Rose Garden event, there's been a great deal of speculation about it. My wife Karen and I were there and honored to be there. Many of the people who were at that event, Susan, actually were tested yes. for coronavirus, and it was an outdoor event, which yeah. all of our scientists regularly and routinely advise. The difference here is President Trump and I trust the American people to make choices in the best interest of their health. Uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris consistently talk about mandates, and not, not just mandates with the coronavirus, but a government takeover of health care, Thank you. Thank the you, Green Vice New President Deal, Pence. all government control. We're about freedom and respecting the freedom of the American people. Let's talk about respecting the American people. 
You respect the American people when you tell them the truth. You respect the American people when you have the courage Which we've to be a leader done. speaking of those things that you may not want people to hear, but they need to hear so they can protect themselves. But this administration stood on information that if you had as a parent, if you had as a worker knowing you didn't have enough money saved up, and now you're standing in a food line because of the ineptitude of an administration that was unwilling to speak the truth to the American people. So let's talk about caring about the American people. The American people have had to sacrifice far too much because of the incompetence of this administration. It is asking too much of the people. Susan, we talk no, about it is asking too much of the people Look, that they would not be equipped with the information they need to help themselves to protect Susan, their parents the and their no, I'm children. Sorry. Uh, Kamala Harris, uh, Senator Harris, I mean, I'm sorry. That's I'm fine, I'm sorry. Kamala. No, no, you're Senator <laughs> Harris to me. Um, for life to get back to normal, Dr. Anthony Fauci and other experts say that most of the people who can be vaccinated need to be vaccinated. But half of Americans now say they wouldn't take a vaccine if it was released now. If the Trump administration approves a vaccine before or after the election, should Americans take it and would you take it? If the public health professionals, if Dr. Fauci, if the doctors, tell us that we should take it, I'll be the first in line to take it. Absolutely. But if Donald Trump tells us I should that we should take it, I'm not taking it. Vice President Pence, there have been a lot of repercussions from this pandemic. In recent days, the president's diagnosis of COVID-19 has underscored the importance of the job that you hold and that you are seeking. That's our second topic tonight. It's the role of the vice president. One of you will make history on January 20th. You, you will be the vice president to the oldest president the United States has ever had. Donald Trump will be 74 years old on Inauguration Day. Joe Biden will be 78 years old. That already has raised concerns among some voters, concerns that have been sharpened by President Trump's hospitalization in recent days. Vice President Pence, have you had a conversation or reached an agreement with President Trump about safeguards or procedures when it comes to the issue of presidential disability? And if not, do you think you should? You have two minutes without interruption. Well, Susan, uh, thank you. Although I would like to go back. I, I to, think we need uh, to move on well, to the issue you, of Well, thank you, but I would like to go back because the reality is that we're going to have a vaccine, Senator, in record time, in unheard of time, in less than a year. We have five companies in phase three clinical trials, and we're right now producing tens of millions of doses. So the fact that you continue to undermine public confidence in a vaccine, exactly. if the vaccine emerges during the Trump administration, I think is, is unconscionable. And Senator, I, I just ask you, stop playing politics with people's lives. The reality is that we will have a vaccine, we believe, before the end of this year. And it will have the capacity to save countless American lives and, and your continuous undermining uh, of confidence in a vaccine is just, it, it's just unacceptable. And let me also say, you know, the reality is when you talk about, about failure in this administration, we actually do know what failure looks like in a pandemic. It was 2009. The swine flu arrived in the United States. Thankfully, it was ended up not being as lethal as the coronavirus. But before the end of the year, when Joe Biden was vice president of the United States, not seven and a half million people contracted the swine flu. Sixty million Americans contracted the swine flu. If the swine flu had been as lethal as the coronavirus in 2009, when Joe Biden was vice president, we would have lost two million American lives. His own chief of staff, Ron Klain, would say last year that it was pure luck that they did, quote, everything possible wrong. And, and we learned from that. They left the strategic national stockpile empty. They left uh, an empty and hollow plan, but we Thank still you, learned President from Pence. it. And I, I think Vice the American President people, Pence, I'm going to say again, can be proud Vice President Pence, I'm sorry, of what we have up. done. And Senator, please Thank you, stop President undermining Pence. confidence in a vaccine. Senator Harris, let me ask you the same question that I asked sure. Vice President Pence, which is, have you had a conversation or reached an agreement with Vice President Biden about safeguards or procedures when it comes to the issue of presidential disability? And if not, and if you win the election next month, 
do you think you should? You have two minutes uninterrupted. So let me tell you, first of all, um, the day I got the call from, from Joe Biden, it was actually a Zoom call, um, asking me to serve with him on this ticket was probably one of the most memorable, day, memorable days of my life. Um, I, you know, I thought about my mother, who came to the United States at the age of 19, um, gave birth to me at the age of 25 at Kaiser Hospital in Oakland, California. And um, the thought that I'd be sitting here right now, um, I know would make her proud, and she must be looking down on this. Um, you know, Joe and I were raised in a very similar way. We were raised with values that are about hard work, about the value and the dignity of public service, and about the importance of fighting for the dignity of all people. And I think Joe asked me to serve with him because you know, I have a career that included being elected the first woman district attorney of San Francisco, where I created models of innovation for, for law enforcement in terms of reform of the criminal justice system. I was elected um, the first uh, woman of color and black woman to be elected attorney general of the state of California, where I ran the second largest department of justice in the United States, second only to the United States Department of Justice. And there I took on everything from transnational criminal organizations to the big banks that were taking advantage of homeowners to for-profit colleges that were taking advantage of veterans. And then, of course, now I serve in the United States Senate as only the second black woman ever elected to the United States Senate. I serve on the Senate Intelligence Committee, where I've been in regular receipt of classified information about threats to our nation and hotspots around the world. I've traveled the world. I've met with our soldiers in, our, in war zones. And I think Joe has asked me to serve with him because he knows that we share, we share a purpose which is about lifting up the American people. And after the four years that we have seen of Donald Trump unifying our country around our common values and principles. Thank you, Senator Harris. You know, neither, neither President Trump nor Vice President Biden has released a sort of detailed health information that had become the modern norm until the 2016 election. And in recent days, President Trump's doctors have given misleading answers or refused to answer basic questions about his health. And my question to each of you, in turn, is, is this information voters deserve to know? Vice President Pence, would you like to go first? Well, I, uh, Susan, thank you. And, uh, and let, me, let me say, on behalf of the president, and the First Lady, how moved we've all been by the outpouring of prayers and concern for the President. And I do believe it's emblematic of the prayers and the concern that have ushered forth for every American impacted by the coronavirus. But the care the President received at Walter Reed Hospital, the White House doctors, was exceptional. And the transparency that they practiced all along the way will continue. The American people have a right to know about the health and well-being of their president, and we'll continue to do that. But I'm just extremely grateful and was more than, more than a little moved uh, by the broad and bipartisan support. And, uh, Senator, I want to thank you and Joe Biden for your expressions and genuine concern. And I also want to congratulate you, uh, as I did on that phone call, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. on uh, the historic nature of your nomination. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I never expected to be on this stage four years ago, so I know the feeling. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, the reality is um, we've got an election before the American people in the midst of this challenging year. And the stakes have never been higher, Thank but you. I think the Thank choice you, has President. never been clear. Yes, I want to so. give Senator Harris a chance to respond to the same question I asked, which is, do voters have a right to know more detailed health information about presidential candidates and especially about presidents? especially when they're facing some kind of challenge. Absolutely. And that's why Joe Biden has been so incredibly transparent. And certainly, by contrast, um, the, the president has not, um, both in terms of health records, but also let's look at taxes. Um, we now know, because of great investigative journalism, that Donald Trump paid $750 in taxes. When I first heard about it, I, I literally said, you mean $750,000? And it was like, no, $750. We now know Donald Trump owes and is in debt for $400 million. And just so everyone is clear, when, when we say in debt, it means you owe money to somebody. And it'd be really good to know who the president of the United States, the commander in chief, 
owes money to because the American people have a right to know what is influencing the president's decisions. And is he making those decisions on the best interest of the American people, of you, or self-interest? So, Susan, I'm glad you asked about transparency, because it has to be across the board. Joe has been incredibly transparent over many, many years. The one thing we all know about Joe, he puts it all out there. He, he is honest, he is forthright, but Donald Trump, on the other hand, Susan. has been Thank about covering up everything. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Senator Harris. I want to give you a chance to respond, Vice President. Well, look, I, I respect the fact that Joe Biden spent 47 years in public life. And I respect your public service as well. Thank you. But the American people have a president who is a businessman, who's a job creator, who's paid tens of millions of dollars in taxes payroll taxes, property taxes. He's created tens of thousands of American jobs. And the president said those public reports are not accurate. And, and the president's also released literally stacks of financial disclosures the American people can review just as the law allows. But the distinction here is that Joe Biden, 47 years in public service, compared to President Donald Trump, who brought all of that experience four years ago. Thank you, thank you, and Vice President. And turned this economy around by cutting taxes, rolling back regulation, thank you, thank American you, Vice President. Energy, yes. fighting for free and fair trade, and all thank, of that. Thank on you, the Vice line President. If Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. You know, that's a are good in segue way. into our that's third topic, segue. which is about the economy. This has been another aspect of life for Americans. It's been so affected by this coronavirus. We have a jobs crisis brewing. On Friday, we learned that the unemployment rate had declined to 7.9 percent in September, but the job growth had stalled. And that was before the latest round of layoffs and furloughs in the airline industry at Disney and elsewhere. Hundreds of thousands of discouraged workers have stopped looking for work. Nearly 11 million jobs that existed at the beginning of the year haven't been replaced. Those hardest hit include Latinos, blacks, and women. Senator Harris, the Biden-Harris campaign has proposed new programs to boost the economy, and you would pay for that new spending by raising $4 trillion in taxes on wealthy individuals and corporations. Some economists warn that could curb entrepreneurial ventures that fuel growth and create jobs. Would raising taxes put the recovery at risk? And you have two minutes to answer uninterrupted. Thank you. Um, on the issue of the economy, I, th I think there couldn't be a more fundamental difference between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Joe Biden believes you measure the health and the strength of America's economy based on the health and the strength of the American worker and the American family. On the other hand, you have Donald Trump, who measures the strength of the economy based on how rich people are doing, which is why he passed a tax bill benefiting the top 1 percent and the biggest corporations of America, leading to a $2 trillion deficit that the American people are going to have to pay for. On day one, Joe Biden will repeal that tax bill. He'll get rid of it. And what he'll do with the money is invest it in the American people. And through a plan that is about investing in infrastructure, something that Donald Trump said he would do, I remember hearing about some infrastructure week, I don't think it ever happened, but Joe Biden will do that. He'll invest in infrastructure. It's about upgrading our roads and bridges, but also investing in clean energy and renewable energy. Joe is going to invest that money in what we need to do around innovation. There was a time when our country believed in science and invested in research and development so that we were an innovation leader on the globe. Joe Biden will use that money to invest in education. So, for example, for folks who want to go to a two-year community college, it will be free. If you come from a family that makes less than $125,000, you'll go to a public university for free. And across the board, we'll make sure that if you have student loan debt, it's cut by $10,000. That's how Joe Biden thinks about the economy, which is it's about investing in the people of our country, as opposed to passing a tax bill, which had the benefit of letting American corporations go offshore to do their business. Thank you, You're Senator welcome. Harris. Vice President Pence, your administration has been predicting a rapid and robust recovery. But the latest economic report suggests that's not happening. Should Americans be braced for an economic comeback that is going to take not months, but a year or more? You have two minutes to answer uninterrupted. When President Trump and I took office, 
America had gone through the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression. It's when Joe Biden was vice president, they tried to tax and spend and regulate and bail our way back to a growing economy. President Trump cut taxes across the board. Despite what uh, Senator Harris says, the average American family of four had $2,000 in savings in taxes. And with the rise in wages that occurred, most predominantly for blue collar, hardworking Americans, the average household income for a family of four increased by $4,000 following President Trump's tax cuts. But America, you just heard Senator Harris tell you, on day one, Joe Biden's going to raise your taxes. It's really remarkable to think, That's Susan. Not what I, said. I mean, right after a time where we're going through a pandemic that lost 22 million jobs at the height, we've already added back 11.6 million jobs because we had a president who cut taxes, rolled back regulation, unleashed American energy, fought for free and fair trade, and secured $4 trillion from the Congress of the United States to give direct payments to families, save 50 million jobs through the Paycheck Protection Program. We literally have spared no expense to help the American people and the American worker through this. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris want to raise taxes. They want to bury our economy under a $2 trillion Green New Deal which you were one of the original co-sponsors of in the United States Senate. They want to abolish fossil fuels and ban fracking, which would cost hundreds of thousands of American jobs all across the heartland. And Joe Biden wants to go back to the economic surrender to China, that when we took office, half of our international trade deficit was with China alone. And Joe Biden wants to repeal all of the tariffs that President Trump put into effect to fight for American jobs and American workers. Joe Biden says democracy is on the ballot. Make no mistake about it, Susan. The, the American economy, the American comeback is on the ballot with four more years of growth Thank you, and opportunity, Thank four you, more President. years of President Donald Trump. 2021 Thank is going to be President the biggest Pence. economic year in the history of this country. Thank you, Vice President Pence. Senator Harris? Well, I mean, I thought we saw enough of it in last week's debate, but I think this is supposed to be a debate based on fact and truth. And the truth and the fact is Joe Biden has been very clear he will not raise taxes on anybody who makes less than four hundred thousand dollars a year. He said he's going to repeal the Trump tax cuts. Uh, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. Well, wait, wait. I'm speaking. Be important if you said the truth. Right. Joe Biden said <laughs> twice in the debate last week that he's going to repeal the Trump tax cuts. That was tax cuts that gave the average working family two thousand dollars in a tax break every single year. That Senator, is, that is that's absolutely the math. not true. That is he tax only bill, cutting? Is he only going to repeal part of the Trump tax cuts? If you don't mind letting me finish, we can Please. then have a conversation. OK? Please. OK. Joe Biden will not raise taxes on anyone who makes less than four hundred thousand dollars a year. He has been very clear about that. Joe Biden will not end fracking. He has been very clear about that. <laughs> Joe Biden is the one who, during the, the Great Recession, was responsible for the Recovery Act that brought America back. And now the Trump-Pence administration wants to take credit when they, ran, when they rode the co coattails of Joe Biden's success for the economy that they had at the beginning of their term. Of course, now the economy is a complete disaster. But Joe Biden, on the one hand, did that. On the other hand, you have Donald Trump who has reigned over a recession that is being compared to the Great Depression. On the one hand, you have Joe Biden, who was responsible with President Barack Obama for the Affordable Care Act, which brought health care to over 20 million Americans and protected people with pre-existing conditions. And what it also did is it saved those families who otherwise were going bankrupt because of hospital bills they could not afford. On the other hand, you have Donald Trump, who's in court right now, trying to get rid of Thank you, trying Harris. to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, which means that you will lose protections if you have pre-existing conditions. And I just this is very important, Susan. Yes, and it's important. We need to give we need to give Vice President. I, I just like to, he interrupted me, and I'd like to just finish, please. If you have a pre-existing condition, heart disease, diabetes, breast cancer, they're coming for you. If you love someone who has a pre-existing condition, Thank you. Thank they're you, coming Harris. for you. It's if you are under the age of 26 on your parents' coverage, they're coming for you. Senator Harris, thank you. You're Let me give you a chance to respond. Well, I hope we have a chance to talk about health care, because Obamacare was a disaster. And the American people remember it well. And President Trump and I have a plan to, to improve health care and protect pre-existing conditions for every 
American. But look, uh, Senator Harris, you're, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. You yourself said on multiple occasions when you were running for president that you would ban fracking. Joe Biden looked at a supporter in the eye and pointed and said, I guarantee, I guarantee that we will abolish fossil fuels. They have a $2 trillion version of the Green New Deal, Susan, that your newspaper, USA Today, said really wasn't that very di different from the original Green New Deal. More taxes, more regulation, banning fracking, abolishing fossil fuel, crushing American energy, and economic surrender to China is a prescription for <laughs> economic decline. President Trump and I will keep America growing. The V-shaped recovery that's underway right now will continue with four more years of President Donald Trump. In the thank, thank you very, very much, Vice President Pence. Once again, you've provided the perfect segue to a new topic, which is climate change. And Vice President Pence, I'd like to pose the first question to you. This year, we've seen record-setting hurricanes in the South. Another one, Hurricane Delta, is now threatening the Gulf. And we have seen record-setting wildfires in the West. Do you believe, as the scientific community has concluded, that man-made climate change has made wildfires bigger, hotter, and more deadly, and have made hurricanes wetter, slower, and more damaging. You have two minutes uninterrupted. Thank you, Susan. Well, first, I'm very proud of our record on the environment and on conservation. According to all of the best estimates, our, our air and land are cleaner than any time ever recorded, and our water is among the cleanest in the world. And just a little while ago, the president signed the Outdoors Act. It's the largest investment in our public lands and public parks in 100 years. So President Trump has made a commitment to conservation and to the environment. Now, with regard to climate change, the climate is changing. But the issue is, what's the cause and what do we do about it? And President Trump has made it clear that we're going to continue to listen to the science. Now, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris would put us back in the Paris Climate Accord. They'd impose the Green New Deal, which would crush American energy, would increase the energy costs of American families in their homes, and literally would crush American jobs. And President Trump and I believe that the progress that we have made in a cleaner environment has been happening precisely because we have a strong free market economy. You know, what's remarkable is the United States has reduced CO2 more than the countries that are still in the Paris Climate Accord, but we've done it through innovation, and we've done it through natural gas and fracking, which, Senator, the American people can go look at the record. I, I know Joe Biden says otherwise now, as you do, but the both of you repeatedly committed to abolishing fossil fuel and banning a fracking. And so by creating the kind of American innovation, we're actually steering toward a stronger and better environment. With regard to wildfires, President Trump and I believe that forest management has to be front and center, and even Governor Gavin Newsom from your state has agreed we've got to work on forest management. And with regard to hurricanes, the <laughs> National Oceanic Administration tells us that actually as, as difficult as they are, Thank you, Vice President. there are no more hurricanes today than Thank there you. were 100 years ago. Thank you. But many of the climate alarmists Pence, use sorry, hurricanes and wildfires to try and Thank sell you, their Vice bill President of goods Pence. of a Green New Deal. And President Trump and I are going to always put Thank American you, jobs and American Pence. workers first. Senator Harris, as the vice president mentioned, you co-sponsored the Green New Deal in Congress. But Vice President Biden said in last week's debate that he does not support the Green New Deal. But if you look at the Biden-Harris campaign website, it describes the Green New Deal as a crucial framework. What exactly would be the stance of a Biden-Harris administration toward the Green New Deal? You have two minutes uninterrupted. Sure. So, first of all, I will repeat, and the American people know, that Joe Biden will not ban fracking. That is a fact. That is a fact. I will repeat that Joe Biden has been very clear that he thinks about growing jobs, which is why he will not increase taxes for anyone who makes less than $400,000 a year. Joe Biden's economic plan, Moody's, which is a reputable Wall Street firm, has said will create 7 million more jobs than Donald Trump's. And part of those jobs that will be created by Joe Biden 
are going to be about clean energy and renewable energy. Because you see, Joe understands that the west coast of our country is burning, including my home state of California. Joe sees what is happening on the Gulf states, which are being battered by storms. Joe has seen and talked with the farmers in Iowa, whose entire crops have been destroyed because of floods. And so Joe believes, again, in science. I'll tell you something, Susan. I served, when I first got to the Senate, on the committee that's responsible for the environment. Do you know this administration took the word science off the website and then took the phrase climate change off the website? This, we have seen a pattern with this administration, which is they don't believe in science. And Joe's plan is about saying, we're going to deal with it, but we're also going to create jobs. Donald Trump, when asked about the wildfires in California, and, and the question was, you know, the science is telling us this, you know what Donald Trump said? Science doesn't know. So let's talk about who is prepared to lead our country over the course of the next four years on what is an existential threat to us as human beings. Joe is about saying we're going to invest that in renewable energy. It's going to be about the creation of millions of jobs. We will achieve net um, zero emissions by 2050, carbon neutral by 2035. Joe has a plan. This has been a lot of talk from the Trump administration, and really it has been to go backward instead of forward. We will also reenter the climate agreement with pride. Senator Harris just said that climate change is an existential threat. Vice President Pence, do you believe that climate change poses an existential threat? As I said, Susan, the climate is changing. We'll follow the science. But uh, once again, um, Senator Harris um, is denying the fact that they're going to raise taxes on every American. Joe Biden said twice in the debate last week that on day one, he was going to repeal the Trump tax cuts. Those tax cuts delivered $2,000 in tax relief to the average family of four across America. And with regard to banning fracking, I just recommend that people look at the record. You yourself said repeatedly that you would ban fracking. You were the first Senate co-sponsor of the Green New Deal. And while Joe Biden denied the Green New Deal, Susan, thank you for pointing out the Green New Deal is on their campaign website. And as USA Today said, it's essentially the same plan as you co-sponsored with AOC when she submitted it in the Senate. And you just heard the senator say that she's going to resubmit America to the Paris Climate Accord. Look, the, the American people have always cherished our environment. We'll continue to cherish it. We've made great progress reducing CO2 emissions through American innovation and the development of natural gas through fracking. We don't need a massive $2 trillion Green New Deal that would impose all new mandates on American businesses and American families. Thank you. Joe Biden wants us Thank to you, retrofit 4 million Thank American you, Vice President. business yes. buildings. It makes no sense. It will cost jobs. President Trump Thank is going to put President. America yes. first. He's going to put jobs first. And we're going to take care of our environment and follow the science. Thank but, you, uh, Vice you President. Know, on the issue of jobs, Senator Harris. let's talk about that. You, the, the vice president earlier referred to, as part of what he thinks is an accomplishment, um, the, the president's trade war with China. You lost that trade war. You lost it. What ended up happening is because of a so-called trade war with China, America lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. Farmers have experienced bankruptcy because of it. We are in a manufacturing recession because of it. And when we look at where this administration has been, there are estimates that by the end of the term of this administration, they will have lost more jobs than almost any other presidential administration. Susan. And the American people know what I'm talking about. You know. I, I think about 20-year-olds. You know, we have a 20-year-old, a, a 20-something-year-old, who are coming out of high school and college right now, and you're wondering, is there going to be a job there for me? We're looking at people who are trying to figure out how they're going to pay rent by the end of the month. Almost half of American renters are worried about whether they're going to be able to pay rent by the end of the month. This is where the economy is in America right now, and it is because of the catastrophe and the failure of leadership of this administration. Thank you, Senator Harris. Vice President Pence, let me give you just 15 seconds to respond, because then I want to move on to— Well, I, I'd love to respond. Look, um, lost the 
trade war with China, Joe Biden never fought it. Joe Biden has been a cheerleader for communist China through over the last several decades. And, and again, uh, Senator Harris, you're entitled to your opinion. You're not entitled to your own facts. When Joe Biden was vice president, we lost 200,000 manufacturing jobs. And President Obama said they were never coming back. He said we needed a magic wand to bring them back. In our first three years after we cut taxes, you, rolled vice back president. regulation, unleashed American energy, this administration saw 500,000 manufacturing jobs yes. created. And that's exactly the kind of growth we're going to continue to see as we bring our nation through thank you, this president. pandemic. Yes. The Green New thank Deal, you, your massive president. new yes. mandate, your Paris Climate Accord, it's going to kill jobs this time, just like it killed jobs. I, 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 just, I, I just need to respond very briefly, uh, 15 please. seconds, and thank then you. we'll move Thank on. you. Joe Biden is responsible for saving America's auto industry, and you voted against it. So let's set the record straight. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to talk about China. We have, as our next topic, we have no more complicated or consequential foreign relationship than the one with China. It is a huge market for American agricultural goods. It's a potential partner in dealing with climate change in North Korea. And in a video tonight, President Trump again blamed it for the coronavirus, saying China will pay. Vice President Pence, how would you describe our, our fundamental relationship with China? Competitors, adversaries, enemies? You have two minutes. Thank you, Susan. Well, let me, before I leave that, let me, let me speak to voting records if I can. You know, everybody knows that NAFTA cost literally thousands of American factories to close. We saw automotive jobs go south of the border. President Trump fought to renegotiate NAFTA. And the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement is now the law of the land. American people deserve to know Senator Kamala Harris was one of only 10 members of the Senate to vote against the USMCA. It was a huge win for American auto workers. It was a huge win for American farmers, especially dairy in the upper Midwest. But, Senator, you, you said it didn't go far enough on climate change. Mm -hmm. That, that you put your, your radical environmental agenda ahead of American auto workers and ahead of American jobs. I think the American people deserve to know that. It's probably why Newsweek magazine said that, that Kamala Harris was the most liberal member of the United States Senate in 2019, more liberal than Bernie Sanders, uh, more, more liberal than any of the others in the United States Senate. So now, with regard to China, look, Susan, first and foremost, China is to blame for the coronavirus. And President Trump is not happy about it. He's made that very clear, made it clear again today. China and the World Health Organization did not play straight with the American people. They did not let our personnel into China to get information on the coronavirus until the middle of February. Fortunately, President Trump, in dealing with China from the outset of this administration, standing up to China that had been taking advantage of America for decades, in the wake of Joe Biden's cheerleading for China, President Trump made that decision before the end of January to suspend all travel from China. And again, the American people deserve to know Joe Biden opposed President Trump's decision to suspend all travel from China. He said it was hysterical. He said it Thank was you, xenophobic. Vice President Pence. But President Trump Vice has President stood Pence, up your to time China. Up. We're going to continue to stand strong. Thank you, Vice President Pence. We want to improve the relationship, but we're going to level the playing field, and we're going to hold Vice China accountable for what they did to America with the coronavirus. Thank you. Senator Harris, let me ask you the same question that I asked the Vice President. How would you describe our fundamental relationship with China? Are we competitors, adversaries, enemies? You'll have two minutes uninterrupted. Susan, the Trump administration's perspective and approach to China has resulted in the loss of American lives, American jobs, and America's standing. There is a weird obsession that President Trump has had with getting rid of whatever accomplishment was achieved by President Obama and Vice President Biden. For example, they created within the White House an office that basically was responsible for monitoring pandemics. They got away, they, they got rid of it. Not true. There was a team of disease experts that President Obama and Vice President Biden dispatched to China to monitor what 
is now predictable and what might happen. They pulled them out. We now are looking at 210,000 Americans who have lost their lives. Let's look at the job situation. We mentioned before the trade deal, the trade war, they wanted to call it, with China. It resulted in the loss of over 300 manufacturing jobs and a manufacturing recession and the American consumer paying thousands of dollars more for goods because of that failed war that they called it. Then let's talk about standing. Pew, a reputable research firm, has done an analysis that shows that leaders of all of our formerly allied countries have now decided that they hold in greater esteem and respect Xi Jinping, the head of the Chinese Communist Party, than they do Donald Trump, the president of the United States, the commander in chief of the United States. This is where we are today because of a failure of leadership by this administration. Senator Harris, we've seen changes in the, in the role of the United States in terms of global leadership over the past four years. And of course, times do change. What's your definition? We've seen strains with China, of course, as the vice president mentioned. We've seen strains with our traditional allies yeah. in NATO and elsewhere. What is your definition of the role of American leadership in 2020? So, you know, Joe is, I, I love talking with Joe about a lot of these issues. And, you know, Joe, he, I think he said it quite well. He says, you know, foreign policy, it might sound complicated, but really it's relationships. So just think about it as relationships. And so we know this in our personal and professional relationships. Um, you got to keep your word to your friends. You got to be loyal to your friends. People who have stood with you, you got to stand with them. You got to know who your adversaries are and keep them in check. But what we have seen with Donald Trump is that he has betrayed our friends and, 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 and embraced dictators around the world. Let's take, for example, Russia. So Russia, I serve on the Intelligence Committee of the United States Senate. America's intelligence community told us Russia interfered in the election of the president of the United States in 2016 and is playing in 2020. Christopher Wray, the director of the FBI, said the same. But Donald Trump, the commander in chief of the United States of America, prefers to take the word of Vladimir Putin over the word of the American intelligence community. You look at our friends at NATO. He has walked away from agreements. You can talk, look at the Iran nuclear deal, which now has put us in a position where we are less safe because they are building up what might end up being a significant nuclear arsenal. We were in that deal, guys. We were in the Iran nuclear deal with friends, with allies around the country. And because of Donald Trump's unilateral approach to foreign policy, coupled with his isolationism, he pulled us out and has made America less safe. So, Susan, it's about relationships. And the thing that has always been part of the strength of our nation, in addition to our great military, has been that we keep our word. But Donald Trump doesn't understand that, because he doesn't understand what it means to be honest. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Harris. Vice President Pence, let me give you a chance to respond. Well, thank you. Um, well, President Trump kept his word when we moved the American embassy to Jerusalem, the capital of the state of Israel. When Joe Biden was vice president, they promised to do that, and they never did. We stood strong with our allies, but we've been demanding. NATO is now contributing more to our common defense than ever before, thanks to President Trump's leadership. We've strengthened our alliances across the Asia Pacific, and we've stood strong uh, against those who would do us harm. You know, when President Trump came into office, uh, ISIS had captured an area of the Middle East the size of Pennsylvania. But President Trump uh, unleashed the American military. And our armed forces destroyed the ISIS caliphate and took down their leader, al-Baghdadi, without one American casualty. Al-Baghdadi was uh, responsible uh, for the death of thousands. Um, but notably, America's hearts today are with the family of Kayla Mueller, her parents of which are here with us tonight in Salt Lake City. Today, two of the ISIS killers responsible for Kayla Mueller's murder were brought to justice in the United States 
Jihadi John was killed on the battlefield along with the other beetle. The reality is that when Joe Biden was vice president, we had an opportunity to save Kayla Miller. It breaks my heart to reflect on it, but the military came into the Oval Office, presented a plan. They said they knew where Kayla was. Baghdadi had held her for 18 months, abused her mercilessly before they killed her. But when Joe Biden was vice president, they hesitated for a month. And when armed forces finally went in, it was clear she'd been moved two days earlier. And her family says with a heart that broke the heart of every American that if President Donald Trump had been president, they believe Kayla would be alive today. Thank you, Vice Look, President. We destroyed the ISIS caliphate. Uh, and you talk about re-entering the Iran nuclear deal. I mean, the last administration transferred $1.8 billion to the leading state sponsor Thank you, Vice of President terrorism. Pence. President Donald Trump got us out of the deal. Thank you, Vice President Pence. And, and when Qasem Soleimani was traveling to Baghdad Thank you, to Vice do President harm Pence. to Americans, President Donald Trump took Thank you Vice out. President Pence. And America is, is safer. Our allies are safer. And the American people know <laughs> President Donald Trump will never have Thank you, Vice to President take Pence. action. I, I would like to give I've Senator heard. Harris a, a chance to respond, but Thank not you. at such great length, because, of course, there are other topics we want to talk about. But I would like equal time. Yes. Thank please you. Please go ahead. Uh, first of all, to the Mueller family, I, I, I know about your daughter's case, and I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, what happened to her is awful, and it should have never happened. And I know Joe feels the same way. And I know that President Obama feels the same way. Um, but you mentioned Soleimani. Let's, let's start there. So after the strike on Soleimani, there was a counter strike on our troops in Iraq. And they suffered serious brain injuries. And do you know what Donald Trump dismissed them as? Headaches. And this is about a pattern of Donald Trump's, where he has referred to our men who are serving in our military as suckers and losers. Donald Trump, who went to Arlington Cemetery and stood above the graves of our fallen heroes and said, What's in it for them? Because, of course, you know, he only thinks about what's in it for him. Let's take what he said about John McCain, a great American hero. And, and, and Donald Trump says he doesn't deserve to be called a hero because he was a prisoner of war. Take, and this is, this is very important, when you want to talk about who is the current commander in chief and what they care about and what they don't care about. Public reporting that Russia had bounties on the heads of American soldiers. And you know what a bounty is? It's somebody puts a price on your head and they will pay it if you are killed. And Donald Trump had talked at least six times to Vladimir Putin and never brought up the subject. Joe Biden would never do that. Thank Joe you. Biden would, but, but Joe Biden. Yeah would hold Russia to account for any threat to our nation's security or to our troops who are sacrificing their lives for the sake of our democracy and our safety. Thank you, S Senator Harris. This is such an important issue, but we have other important issues as well. And Susan, I want to make sure we have a chance to talk about I really have to, to respond about. to that. I, I, I'm, Look, uh, she has— 15 she, seconds, because— Well, I've got to have more than keep, that. Look, well, you, I'm sorry, but Vice President, Look, but you've I, had more time than she's the, had the, so the far. The slanders against President Donald Trump regarding men and women of our armed forces are absurd. I'm, I'm sorry, Vice My President My son is Pence. a captain in the United yes. States Marine Corps. My son-in-law is deployed in the United States Navy. I can assure all of you, with sons and daughters serving in our military, President Donald Trump not only respects but reveres all of those who serve in our armed forces. And any suggestion otherwise is ridiculous. But, Let thank me you, also Vice say, President Pence. Vice the American Pence, people deserve, you know, Susan, Vice the American people deserve I didn't, to know. Uh, Vice President that, Pence, I did not. Uh, excuse me, Susan. The I did not create the rules for tonight. Joe Biden. You, your Trump, campaigns agreed to the rules for tonight's I, debate I, with I, the Commission on Presidential Debates. I'm here to enforce them, which involves moving from one topic to another, giving roughly equal time to both of you, right which ahead. is what I'm trying very hard to go do. Go right ahead. So I want to go ahead and move to the next topic, which is an important one, as the last topic was, and that is the Supreme Court. 
On Monday, the Senate Judiciary Committee is scheduled to open hearings on Amy Coney Barrett's nomination to the Supreme Court. Senator Harris, you'll be there as a member of the committee. Yes. Her confirmation would cement the court's conservative majority and make it likely open to more abortion restrictions, even to overturning the landmark Roe v. Wade ruling. Access to abortion would then be up to the states. Vice President Pence, you're the former governor of Indiana. If Roe v. Wade is overturned, what would you want Indiana to do? Would you want your home state to ban all abortions? You have two minutes, uninterrupted. Well, thank you for the question, but I'll use a little bit of my time to respond to that very important issue before. The American people deserve to know Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general, was responsible for the death of hundreds of American service members. When the opportunity came, we saw him headed to Baghdad to kill more Americans. President Trump didn't hesitate, and Qasem Soleimani is gone. But you deserve to know that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris actually criticized the decision to take out Salem, uh, Qasem Soleimani. It's really inexplicable, but with regard to Joe Biden, it's, it's explainable. Because history records that Joe Biden actually opposed the raid against Osama bin Laden. It's absolutely essential that we have a commander-in-chief who will not hesitate to act to protect American lives and to protect American service members, and that's what you have in President Donald Trump. Now, with regard to the Supreme Court of the United States, let me say President Trump and I could not be more enthusiastic about the opportunity to see Judge Amy Coney Barrett become Justice Amy Coney Barrett. Now, she's a brilliant woman, and um, she will bring a lifetime of experience and a sizable American family to the Supreme Court of the United States. And our hope is, in the hearing next week, unlike Justice Kavanaugh received with treatment from you and others, we hope she gets a fair hearing. And we particularly hope that we don't see the kind of attacks on her Christian faith that we saw before. I mean, the Democrat chairman of the Judiciary Committee before, when, when Judge Barrett was being confirmed for the Court of Appeals, expressed concern that the dogma of her faith lived loudly in her. Dick Durbin of Illinois said that it was a concern. Uh, Senator, I know one of our judicial nominees, you actually attacked because they were a member of the Catholic Knights of Columbus, just because the Knights of Columbus holds pro-life views and Thank you. Views. Thank you, Vice President Pence. So Your time is up. my hope is that when the hearing takes place, that, Thank you, Vice that, President Pence. that Judge Amy Coney Barrett will be respected, Thank you, Vice President Pence. voted and confirmed Thank to the you. Supreme Court of the United States. Senator Harris, you're the senator from and former Attorney General of California. So let me ask you a parallel question to the one I posed to the Vice President. If Roe v. Wade is overturned, what would you want California to do? Would you want your home state to enact no restrictions on access to abortion. And you have two minutes uninterrupted. Thank you, Susan. First of all, Joe Biden and I are both people of faith. And it's insulting su to suggest that we would knock anyone for their faith. And in fact, Joe, if elected, will be only the second uh, practicing Catholic uh, as president of the United States. Um, on the issue of this, of this nomination, Joe and I are very clear, as are the majority of the American people. We are 27 days before the decision about who will be the next president of the United States. And, you know, before, when this conversation has come up, you know, it's been about election year or election time. We're literally in an election. Over 4 million people have voted. People are in the process of voting right now. And so Joe has been very clear, as the American people are, let the American people fill that seat in the White House, and then we'll fill that seat on the United States Supreme Court. And to your point, Susan, the, the issues before us couldn't be more serious. There's the issue of choice, and I will always fight for a woman's right to make a decision about her own body. It should be her decision and not that of Donald Trump and, and the vice president, Michael Pence. But let's also look at what else is before the, the, the court. It's the Affordable Care Act. Like, literally in the midst of a public health pandemic, when over 210,000 people have died and 7 million people probably have what will be in the future considered a pre-existing condition because you, you, you contracted the virus. Donald Trump is in court right now trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. And I said it before, and it bears repeating. This means 
that there will be no more protections if they win for people with pre-existing conditions. Yeah. This means that over 20 million people will lose your coverage. It means that if you're under the age of 26, you can't stay on your parents' coverage anymore. And here's the thing. The contrast couldn't be more clear. They're trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. Thank Joe you. Biden is saying, let's expand coverage. Let's give you a choice of a public Thank option you, or private coverage. Let's bring down PM Thank premiums. You, Senator let's Harris. lower Medicare eligibility to 60. Thank you, Senator That's true Harris. leadership. You know, you mentioned uh, earlier, Vice President Pence, that the president was committed to maintaining protections for people with pre-existing conditions. Um, and, but you do have this court case that you are supporting, your administration supporting, that would strike down the Affordable Care Act. The, the president says, President Trump says that he's going to protect people with pre-existing conditions, but he has not explained how he would do that. And that was one of the toughest nuts to crack when they were passing the Affordable Care Act. So tell us specifically, how would your administration protect Americans with pre-existing conditions to have access to affordable insurance if the Affordable Care Act is struck down? Well, uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, but let me just say, addressing your very first question, I, I couldn't be more proud to serve as vice president to a president who stands without apology for the sanctity of human life. I'm pro-life. I, I don't apologize for it. And this is another one of those cases where there's such a dramatic contrast. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris support taxpayer funding of abortion all the way up to the moment of birth, mm. late-term abortion. They want to increase funding to Planned Parenthood of America. Now, for our part, I, I would never presume how Judge Amy Coney Barrett would rule on the Supreme Court of the United States, but um, we'll continue to stand strong for the right to life. When you speak about the Supreme Court, though, I think the American people really deserve an answer, Senator Harris. Are you and Joe Biden going to pack the court if Judge Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed? I mean, there have been 29 vacancies on the Supreme Court during presidential election years from George Washington to Barack Obama. Presidents have nominated in all 29 cases. But your party is actually openly advocating adding seats to the Supreme Court, which has had nine seats for 150 years, if you don't get your way. This is a classic case of if you can't win by the rules, you're going to change the rules. Now, you've refused to answer the question. Joe Biden has refused to answer the question. So I think the American people would really like to know if Judge Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed to the Supreme Court of the United States, are you and Joe Biden, if somehow you win this election, going to pack the Supreme Court to get your way? I'm so glad we went through a little history lesson. Let's do that a little more. In 1864... Well, I'd like you to answer the question. No, Mr. Yes. Vice President, I'm speaking. Please, please. I'm speaking. Okay. In 1864, one of the, I think, political heroes, certainly of the president, I, I assume of you also, Mr. Vice President, is Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln was up for re-election. And it was 27 days before the election. And a seat became open on the United States Supreme Court. Abraham Lincoln's party was in charge, not only of the White House, but the Senate. But Honest Abe said, it's not the right thing to do. The American people deserve to make the decision about who will be the next president of the United States. And then that person can select who will serve for a lifetime on the highest court of our land. And so Joe and I are very clear. The American people are voting right now. And it should be their decision about who will serve on this most important body for a lifetime. Thank you, and, and Senator the Harris. People, Susan, are voting right now. They'd like to know if you and Joe Biden are going to pack the Supreme Court if you don't get your way in this nomination. Let's talk about packing. You once Come again on. gave a non-answer. Joe Biden gave a non-answer. <laughs> trying to answer you the now. American people deserve a straight answer. And, and if you haven't figured it out yet, the straight answer is they are going to pack the Supreme Court if they somehow win this election. The, Men Mr. and women, Vice I, I, I got to tell you, people across this country, if you cherish our Supreme Court, if you cherish the separation of powers, you need to reject the Biden-Harris ticket come November the 3rd, re-elect President Donald Trump, and we'll stand by that separation of powers in a nine-seat Supreme Court. Yeah, Thank let's you. talk about packing the court, then. Let's talk about the Please. fact— Yeah, I'm, I'm about to. So the Trump-Pence administration has been—because I sit on the Senate Judiciary Committee, Susan, as you mentioned, and I have witnessed 
the appointments for lifetime appointments to the federal courts, district courts, courts of appeal. People who are purely ideological, people who have been reviewed by, by legal professional organizations and found to have been not competent, are substandard. And do you know that of the 50 people who President Trump appointed to the Court of Appeals for lifetime appointments, not one is black? This is what they've been doing. You want to talk about packing a court? Let's have that discussion. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Let's go on and talk about the issue of racial justice. I, I just want the record to reflect she never answered the question. So I think the American thank, people, thank maybe you. the next debate, Joe Biden will answer the question. Thank you, but I think the you. American people know the answer. Thank you, Vice President. In March, Breonna Taylor, a 26-year-old emergency room technician in Louisville, was shot and killed after police officers executing a search warrant in a narcotics investigation broke into her apartment. The police said they identified themselves. Taylor's boyfriend said he didn't hear them do that. He used a gun registered to him to fire a shot, which wounded an officer. The officers then fired more than 20 rounds into the apartment. They say they were acting in self-defense. None of them have been indicted in connection with her death. Senator Harris, in the case of Breonna Taylor, was justice done? You have two minutes. I don't believe so. And I've, I've talked with Brianna's mother, Tamika Palmer, and her family. And her family deserves justice. She was a beautiful young woman. She had as her life goal to become a nurse, and she wanted to become an EMT to first learn what's going on out on the street so she could then become a nurse and save lives. And her life was taken unjustifiably and tragically and violently. And it just, it, it brings me to, you know, the eight minutes and 46 seconds that America witnessed, during which an American man was tortured and killed under the knee of an armed, uniformed police officer. And people around our country, of every race, of every age, of every gender, perfect strangers to each other, marched shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, fighting for us to finally achieve that ideal of equal justice under law. And I was a part of those peaceful protests. And I believe strongly that, first of all, we are never going to condone violence, but we always must fight for the values that we hold dear, including the fight to achieve our ideals. And that's why Joe Biden and I have said on this subject, look, and I'm a, I'm a former career prosecutor. I know what I'm talking about. Bad cops are bad for good cops. We need reform of our policing in America and our criminal justice system, which is why Joe and I will immediately ban chokeholds and carotid holes. George Floyd would be alive today if we did that. We will require a national registry for police officers who break the law. We will, on the issue of criminal justice reform, get rid of private prisons and cash bail, and Thank we you. will decriminalize marijuana, and we, you, will, we will expunge the records of those who have Thank been you, convicted Harris. of marijuana. This is Thank the you, time Senator for Harris. leadership on a tragic, tragic issue Senator Harris, of unarmed black up. people in America who Thank have been Thank you, Senator killed. Harris. Vice President Pence, let me pose the same question to you. In the case of Breonna Taylor, was justice done? You have two minutes uninterrupted. Well, our heart breaks for the loss of any, any innocent American life. And the family of Breonna Taylor has our sympathies. But I, I trust our justice system, a grand jury that refused the evidence. And it really is remarkable that as a former prosecutor, you would assume that an impaneled grand jury looking at all the evidence got it wrong. But uh, you're entitled to your opinion, Senator. I think, look, and with regard to George Floyd, there, there's no excuse for what happened to George Floyd. And justice will be served. But there's also no excuse for the rioting and looting that followed. I mean, it, it really is astonishing. Uh, Flora Westbrook is with us here tonight in Salt Lake City. Just a few weeks ago, I stood at what used to be uh, her salon. It was burned to the ground by rioters and looters. 
And, and Flora is still trying to put her life back together. And I must tell you, this, this, this presumption that you hear consistently uh, from Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, that, uh, that America is systemically racist, mm. and that, as Joe Biden said, that he believes that law enforcement has an implicit bias against minorities uh, is, is a great insult to the men and women who serve in law enforcement. And I want everyone to know who puts on the uniform of law enforcement every day, that President Trump and I stand with you. And it is remarkable that, that when Senator Tim Scott tried to pass a police reform bill, brought together a group of Republicans and Democrats, Senator Harris, you got up and walked out of the room. And then you filibustered Senator a Tim Scott's bill on the Senate floor that would have provided new accountability, new repeat resources. But we don't have to choose between supporting law enforcement, proving public safety, and supporting our African American neighbors you, and President. all of our minorities. Under President Trump's leadership, you, we'll President. always stand with law enforcement and we'll do what we've Vice done from President day Pence, one and thank you. Your improve time is the up. lives of African Americans. Thank you, Vice Record President unemployment, Pence. record Vice investments President in Pence, education, and up. we'll fight for school choice for all of our members. Thank you, Vice President. I'd like to respond. Senator Harris. I will not sit here and be lectured by the Vice President on what it means to enforce the laws of our country. I am the only one on this stage who has personally prosecuted everything from child sexual assault to homicide. I'm the only one on this stage who has prosecuted the big banks for taking advantage of America's homeowners. I'm the only one on this stage who prosecuted for-profit colleges for taking advantage of our veterans. And the reality of this is that we are talking about an election in 27 days, where last week the President of the United States took a debate stage in front of 70 million Americans and refused to condemn white supremacists. Not true. And Not true. It wasn't like he didn't have a chance. He didn't do it, and then he doubled down. And then he said, when pressed, stand back, stand by. And this is a part of a pattern of Donald Trump's. You, he, was, he called Mexicans rapists and criminals. He instituted as his first act a Muslim ban, he on the issue of Charlottesville, where people were peacefully protesting the need for racial justice, where a young woman was killed. And on the other side, there were neo-Nazis carrying tiki torches, shouting racial epithets, anti-Semitic slurs, and Donald Trump, when asked about it, said there were fine people on both sides. This is who we have as the president Susan, of the United Senator, States. And America, Susan. you deserve better. Joe Biden will be a president who brings our country together. Senator Harris. And, and, and recognizes the beauty in our diversity and the fact Senator that we all Harris, have so you. much more in common than what separates us. Vice President Pence, let me give you a minute to respond. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that very much. You know, I think this is one of the things that uh, makes people dislike the media so much in this country, Susan, mm -hmm. is that you selectively edit, just like Senator Harris did, comments that President Trump and I and others on our side of the aisle make. I mean, Senator Harris conveniently omitted, after the, after the president made comments about people on either side of the debate over monuments, he condemned the KKK, neo-Nazis, and white supremacists, and has done so repeatedly. You're concerned that he doesn't condemn neo-Nazis. President Trump has Jewish grandchildren. His daughter and son-in-law are Jewish. This is a president who, who respects and cherishes all of the American people. But you talk about having personally prosecuted. I'm glad you brought up your record, Senator. Thank you. But that's, I, I really need to make this point. When you, were, when you were DA in San Francisco, when you left office, African Americans were 19 times more likely to be prosecuted for minor drug offenses than whites and Hispanics. When you were Attorney General you. of California, you, you increased the, purport, the disproportionate incarceration of Thank blacks you. in California. Yeah. You did nothing on criminal yeah. justice reform in California. You didn't lift a That's, finger to you. pass the First Step Act on Capitol Hill. I mean, the reality is your record speaks you, for Vice itself. President, President Trump and I have fought 
for criminal justice reform. Thank you, Vice President We fought Pence. for educational choice and opportunities for African Americans, all of our members. Thank you, sir. And we'll do it for four Thank you. Years. You know, there is no more important issue than the final issue that we're going to talk about tonight, and that is the issue of the election but, but itself. But he attacked my record. I would like an opportunity okay. to respond. Let me give you 30 seconds because, we, 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 because we're running out of time. I appreciate that. First of all, having served as the Attorney General of the State of California, the work that I did is a model of what our nation needs to do, and we will be able to do under a Joe Biden presidency. Our, our agenda includes what this administration has failed to do. It will be about not only <coughs> instituting a ban on chokeholds and carotid holes. Thank you. Not only, uh, thank you, Senator. I Harris. would like to go through. These are points that you made earlier in the hour, and I want to talk about the election itself before we have to. But I want to talk day. about the connection between what Joe and I will do and my record, which includes I was the first statewide officer to institute a requirement that my agents would wear body cameras and keep them on full time. We were the first to initiate a, a requirement that there would be a training for law enforcement on implicit bias because, yes, Joe Biden and I recognize that implicit bias does exist, Mr. Vice President, contrary to what you may believe. We did the work of instituting reforms that were about re investing in reentry. This is the work that we have done and the work we will do going forward. And again, I will not be lectured by the vice president on our record of what we have done in terms of law enforcement and keeping our communities safe and a commitment to reforming the criminal justice system of America. Thank you, Senator Harris. And I'd like to pose the first, I'd like you to respond first to the question on our final topic, the election itself. President Trump has several times refused to commit himself to a peaceful transfer of power after the election. If your ticket wins and President Trump refuses to accept a peaceful transfer of power, what steps would you and Vice President Biden then take? What would happen next? You have two minutes. So I'll tell you, um, Joe and I are, I think, particularly um, proud of the coalition that we've built around our campaign. We probably have one of the broadest coalitions of folks that you've ever seen in a presidential race. Of course, we have the support of Democrats, but also independents and Republicans. In fact, um, seven members of uh, President George W. Bush's cabinet are supporting our ticket. Uh, we have the support of, of Colin Powell, Cindy McCain, John Kasich, um, over 500. Uh, generals, retired generals and, and former national security experts and advisors are supporting our campaign. And I believe they are doing that because they know that Joe Biden has a deep, deep-seated commitment to fight for our democracy and to fight for the integrity of our democracy and to bring integrity back to the White House. And so we believe in the American people. We believe in our democracy. And here's what I'd like to say to everybody. Vote. Please vote. Vote early. Come up with a plan to vote. Go to IWillVote.com. You can also go to, to JoeBiden.com. We have it within our power in these next 27 days to make the decision about what will be the course of our country for the next four years. And it is within our power. And if we use our vote and we use our voice, we will win. And we will not let anyone subvert our democracy with what Donald Trump has been doing, as he did on the debate stage last week, when again in front of 70 million people, he openly attempted to suppress the vote. Joe Biden, on the other hand, on that same debate stage, because clearly Donald Trump doesn't think he can run on a record because it's a failed record, Joe Biden on that stage said, hey, just please vote. So I'll repeat what Joe said, please vote. Thank you, Senator. Vice President Pence, President Trump has several times refused to commit himself to a peaceful transfer of power after the election. If Vice President Biden is declared the winner and President Trump refuses to accept a peaceful transfer of power, what would be your role and responsibility as vice president? What would you personally do? You have two minutes. Well, Susan, first and foremost, I think we're going to win this election. Because while uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris rattle off a long litany of the establishment in Washington, D.C., an establishment that Joe Biden's been a part of for 47 years, President Donald Trump has, has launched a movement of everyday Americans from every walk of life. 
And uh, I have every confidence that those, those same Americans that delivered that historic victory in 2016, they see this president's record where we rebuild our military. We revived our economy through tax cuts and rolling back regulation, fighting for fair trade, unleashing American energy. We appointed conservatives to our federal courts at every level. And, and we stood with the men and women of law enforcement every single day. And I think, I think that movement of Americans has only grown stronger in the last four years. But when you talk about accepting the outcome of the election, um, I, I must tell you, uh, Senator, your party has spent the last three and a half years trying to overturn the results of the last election. It's amazing. When Joe Biden was vice president of the United States, the FBI actually spied on President Trump and my campaign. I mean, there were documents released this week that the CIA actually made a referral uh, to the FBI documenting that those allegations were coming from the Hillary Clinton campaign. And of course, we've all seen the avalanche, the, what, what you put the country through for, for the better part of, of three years until it was found that there was no obstruction, no collusion, case closed. And then, Senator Harris, you and your colleagues in the, in the Congress uh, tried to impeach the president of the United States over a phone call. And now Hillary Clinton has actually said to Joe Biden that under, in her words, under no circumstances should he concede the election. So let me just say, I think we're going to win this election. President Trump and I are fighting every day in courthouses to prevent Joe Biden and Kamala Harris from changing the rules and creating this universal mail-in voting that will create a massive opportunity for voter fraud. And we have a free and fair election. Uh, we know we're going to have confidence in it. And I believe in all my heart that President Donald Trump's going to be reelected for four more years. You know, I've, uh, I've asked, I've written all the questions that I've asked tonight, but for the final question of the debate, I'd like to um, write a, uh, read a question that someone else wrote. The Utah Debate Commission asked students in the state to write essays about what they would like to ask you. And I want to close tonight's debate with the question posed by Brecklin Brown. She's an eighth grader at Springville Junior High in Springville, Utah. And here's what she wrote, quote, when I watch the news, all I see is arguing between Democrats and Republicans. When I watch the news, all I see is citizen fighting against citizen. When I watch the news, all I see are two candidates from opposing parties trying to tear each other down. If our leaders can't get along, how are the citizens supposed to get along? And then she added, your examples could make all the difference to bring us together, end quote. So to each of you in turn, I'd like you to take one minute and respond to Brecklin. Vice President Pence, you have one minute. Brecklin, it's a wonderful question. And um, let me just commend you for taking an interest in, in public life. I, I started uh, following the news when I was very young. And in America, we believe in a free and open exchange of debate. Uh, and we celebrate that. And it's how we've created literally the freest and most prosperous nation in the history of the world. And I, 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 I would tell you that um, don't assume that what you're seeing on your local news networks is synonymous with the American people. You know, I look at the relationship between Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the late justice who we just lost from the Supreme Court, and the late Justice Antonin Scalia. They were on polar opposites on the Supreme Court of the United States, one very liberal, one very conservative. But what's been learned since her passing was the two of them and their families were the very closest of friends. I mean, here in America, we can disagree. We can debate vigorously, as Senator Harris and I have on this stage tonight. But when the debate is over, we come together as Americans. And that's what people do in big cities and small towns all across this country. So I just want to encourage you, Brecklin. I, I want to tell you that um, we're, we're going to work every day to have government as good as our people. And the American people each and every day love a good debate. We love a good argument. But we always come together and are always there for one another. Thank you. In Vice times President. of need. And we've especially learned that Thank you, through Mr. the Vice difficulties President. of this year. Senator Harris, what would you say to Brecklin? Um, first of all, I, I'm, I love hearing from our young leaders. And when I hear her words, when I hear your words, Brecklin, um, I know our future is bright because it is that perspective on who we are and who we should be. 
um, that is a sign of leadership and is something we should all aspire to be. Um, and that, you know, that brings me to Joe. Joe Biden, one of the reasons that Joe decided to run for president is after Charlottesville, which we talked about earlier. Um, it so troubled him and upset him like it did all of us, that there was that kind of hate and division. Um, what propelled Joe to run for president was to see that over the course of the last four years, what Brecklin described has been happening. Joe has a long-standing reputation of working across the aisle and working in a bipartisan way. Uh, and that's what he's going to do as president. Joe Biden has a history of lifting people up and fighting for their dignity. I mean, you have to know Joe's story to know that Joe has known pain, he has known suffering, and he has known love. And so, Brecklin, when you think about the future, I do believe the future is bright. And it will be because of your leadership, and it will be because we fight for each person's voice through their vote, and we get engaged in this election because you have the ability through your work and through eventually your vote Thank you, to Senator determine Harris. the future of our country and what its leadership looks like. Thank you, Senator Harris. Thank you, Vice President Pence. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We want to thank also the University of Utah for its hospitality, and most of all, our thanks to all the Americans who watched this debate tonight. Again, our best wishes for a quick recovery to President Trump, the First Lady, and everyone who is battling COVID-19. The second presidential debate is next week on October 15th, a town hall-style debate in Miami. We hope you'll join us then. Good evening. And good evening once again from New York. Lester Holt along with Savannah Guthrie. The end of a 90-minute date, a de debate uh, between uh, Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Kamala Harris. Fair to say a lot of people holding their breath after last week, wondering what the tone would be in this debate. Uh, largely civil, Savannah Guthrie. It's not without its moments, but we certainly got a chance this time to hear from both of them and take a measure. And the question, perhaps right now, not who won or lost, but who did what they had to do under the circumstances. Well, tonight we had a debate <laughs> as opposed to a debacle. And for that, I think uh, a lot of Americans are breathing a sigh of relief, a lot of different topics covered. And it was mostly civil. There was a, some back and forth, but substance was discussed. COVID COVID was discussed, the Supreme Court, a uh, lot of talk about manufacturing and jobs. It's a real tell that this battleground, this, this campaign is being fought in the industrial Midwest. I want to bring in Chuck Todd. Chuck, as you watch tonight, and, and Lester's question is, is spot on, you know, who, who did what they had to do? And did they both do what they had to do? Well, I don't mean to be do a cop out here, but that's where I was going to land is they you could tell they both sort of had a game plan and I think they both executed their game plan. The question is whether it's going to move the needle at all. I mean, if you want to get into, you know, I did I, I thought Kamala Harris got off to a little bit of a slow start, but I thought she really um, uh, got her sea legs, got comfortable and got strong. And look, Mike Pence did a lot of evading and deflection. Um, he was dealt a tough hand, as we said at the beginning, with the virus and where things are. Um, and look, I think there are some in the Trump campaign are going to be pleased with how he deflected uh, and how he ev evaded. But there are going to be some people who are frustrated about the constant uh, amount of time that Mike Pence avoided answering a direct question. Now, there is a direct question issue for Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. It is one that they seem to not want to deal with, which is the Supreme Court question about expanding it. But that was a, one thing that jumped out at me at this debate was, again, it was clear that was Mike Pence's plan. Deflect some of these attacks. Don't get bogged down in the details. But I wonder if the evasion started started to wear thin with uh, some viewers. Let me go to Andrea Mitchell. I know you were feverishly taking notes through all of this. What stood out to you, Andrea? 
Well, I think that Kamala Harris really did warm up and hit her points on white supremacy, on climate, certainly on COVID, pre-existing conditions. She managed to get through and speak directly to the camera and was a very effective debater. Mike Pence was effective in defending President Trump and dodging the questions, an artful dodge, if you will, because he didn't respond to the failures of the coronavirus task force that he leads, which have been very well documented by insiders, by the audio tapes from Bob Woodward. He basically said that, accused her of attacking the American people for their response to the pandemic. But, you know, if you are a supporter of the Trump Pence agenda, you believe that he did a very good job. And he certainly filled the time and got a lot more time by talking over the time limits. And Susan Page, I think, did a really good job of trying to hold them to a format. Chuck, I also thought that um, Mike Pence, you know, landed some punches, but unlike his boss, did it with a velvet glove. So mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it was a, a different style, but he certainly but, took it to the, the Biden-Harris team. No, I agree, and that's what he does well, and, and, and it's when he was at his most effective. It was what was, in fact, he was very effective at almost avoiding a question, avoiding a response, and then just going right back on offense, trying uh, trying to, to, to land a, a policy hit. So, look, I, I agree with that. I think he did best when he was talking about Biden's record. Where he struggled is when he was having to defend the Trump record. And I think that, that was, and I think with Kamala Harris, I would argue that that I think she struggled at times trying to defend some of Biden's record or defend the, the ticket. Um, she was obviously much more comfortable prosecuting a case against the Trump administration. I'll tell you, one of the things that struck me, I felt like the coronavirus, a lot of the uh, talking points were left on the table, uh, given especially what we have seen over the last uh, four or five days involving the president. I don't know if anybody else. I, you I, know, Lester, I, I had a feeling that I think, I felt like there was a little bit of eggshell walking on that. I think that, that because of, of how personal it is, I, I noticed that too. Uh, and this was part of me that thought, you know what, they don't want to go there right now. But I also thought, Lester, that there have been so many things said by the president in the video tonight, in the video when he first came back, not wearing a mask. I was surprised that the whole issue of masks didn't come up because the, the vice president talked about mandates. but. It's the advice of their own public health officials and their refusal to wear masks and all the things that they've been justly criticized for, him taking off the mask when he first came back to the White House. I was surprised that that did not come up and that she didn't score on those points. Let me bring in Casey Hunt, who, of course, covers Capitol Hill for us. I heard Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, say she had texted some encouragement to Kamala Harris before the debate and then said, health care, health care, health care. That is clearly the terrain that the Democrats want to run on, and Kamala Harris certainly brought it up at every available opportunity. She did, Savannah, and that was one of her most direct lines, looking into the camera and saying, they're coming for you, talking about people's health care uh, and, and what they are relying on now, especially uh, in a pandemic, where if, in fact, they were to lose coverage from pre -existing, for pre-existing conditions, so many people would suddenly have the pre-existing condition of having had uh, COVID in the past. But, you know, one thing that stuck out to me, Savannah, and as I was listening to uh, the conversation is, you know, Kamala Harris, with a smile pushed back on Mike Pence's repeated talking over time and interrupting her. She was sort of very deft uh, and, and careful to uh, when she said, hey, you're interrupting me. It's it's my turn to speak. She was careful about it. And the style with which she did that seemed uh, practiced, but also familiar to those of us who have covered her on Capitol Hill. It's one of the ways she's effective in this way. Feels like he got more time, though. I mean, we'll find out. But it seemed like by him going over and doing taking that different tax, he might have gotten more airtime. I think it's entirely possible, and, and we've already seen, uh, you know, some pressure on, on Susan Page who, the, as the moderator who, you know, struggled uh, to push back against Pence and kept repeatedly saying, thank you, Mr. Vice President, thank you. Um, and I think you saw Harris, as the debate went on, start to interject herself more and say, no, I am going to take uh, the time that I have uh, for myself. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I also want to touch on, Savannah, too, the Supreme Court, and this is another thing that Pence did from a tactical perspective. He actually 
Actually, is the one who asked Kamala Harris about uh, what's called packing the court. This idea that Democrats, if they control the Senate and the White House, might add justices to the Supreme Court. And Kamala Harris wouldn't answer uh, that question. Uh, she sort of deflected instead, and, and that reflects some tensions uh, in the Democratic Party. That there is pressure from the left to do this, and it's something that makes centrists in the party uncomfortable. So that was a moment uh, where uh, she struggled to answer a question, uh, even though, of course, throughout the night. We saw Mike Pence repeatedly uh, decline to answer the questions that the moderator uh, put to him and instead uh, answer in different ways. Uh, joining us now is radio talk show host Hugh Hewitt. Uh, he's an NBC News political analyst and president of the Richard Nixon Foundation. He's also a Trump supporter. And David Pluff was a senior advisor to Barack Obama as candidate and as president and helped him prepare for debates. He's a Biden supporter and an NBC News analyst. Uh, thanks to both of you for uh, joining us. Hugh, let me first start with you and pick up on uh, the vice president really going after uh, Senator Harris on this issue of packing the court. Was that, in your view, his strongest moment? And, and what will the effect be? Uh one of three, fracking, fracking, fracking for the Pennsylvanians out there who are watching and wondering. The Supreme Court being packed, which is exactly what uh, President Trump brought up to Vice President Biden last week, in which the Republicans would like to underscore the radical nature of the Democratic agenda. But I also think that in the end, when they talked about Amy Coney Barrett and the Vice President got in an uninterrupted minute and a half, uh, a building of a fence around Judge Barrett, that she not be attacked about her religious faith, about people of praise, that the dogma lives deeply within her. Uh, the vice president brought up uh, Senator Harris's attack on a different digital nominee for belonging to the Knights of Columbus. I believe that that was one thing they really wanted to get done tonight, which was to establish that uh, Judge Barrett must not be uh, uh, subjected to a religious test next week. I think Mike Pence accomplished that. And accomplished a lot for the campaign in doing so. And let's assume for a moment that the president is able to debate at the next debate. Did uh, did Vice President Pence build ground? Did he did he set the stage for the president to perhaps have a better debate performance? Yeah, it's like a volleyball match at the Olympics. He put the ball in the air. The spike's got to come on the packing of the court. And I think if the president models on the way that the vice president conducted himself, I thought it was a very amicable debate within the norms of every debate I've ever seen. The last one was not. I know that Susan Page had trouble with both of them. I know she got rolled by Senator Harris at the end. But this was a normal debate. And I think it sets up the third debate very well. Well, let me turn to David Pluff, who, of course, was uh, President Obama's senior advisor uh, in and I just ask you, David, I mean, first of all, I want to get your take on Senator Harris, but why has this issue of court packing tied, tied Biden and now Harris in such knots? I mean, wouldn't you have expected them to have a better response knowing that this question is coming? Well, first of all, I think the most important issue in this debate, Savannah, was the coronavirus. And I think Kamala Harris did a good job of prosecuting that case, number one. Number two, I think Joe Biden's leading in this race, having prepared for presidential debates. Here's really the only question that matters. Are voters going to do something different after the debate than they were doing before the debate. And my strong suspicion is not. I also think she looked like someone who could handle the office. Uh, and I think Joe Biden now is leading that race. And I think that's a question people have. I think on the court, um, I'm sure Joe Biden's going to get asked about that next week, and I'm sure he'll have an answer for that. But I think she did a very good job of raising the stakes on health care, on pre-existing condition, on a woman's right to choose, which every poll I've seen shows almost two-thirds of the country being very concerned about those issues. What was Senator Harris's mission tonight? Was it just to hold fast and do no harm and try to hold on to what appears to be a lead in the polls? Well, it's a great question, Lester. I think the question is, you don't want to play safe. My view in politics has always been when you're ahead, you need to press your advantage. And I think she did that on the coronavirus. I thought she did that on taxes. I thought she did that on the economy. So um, I think, but yes, when you're ahead, and Joe Biden has a significant, stable, and you might even argue growing lead, is you don't want to set back that cause. And that's the question. Time is running out. So maybe serve was held today. That's not good enough for the Trump-Pence ticket, as millions of Americans have already voted, and Election Day is looming. But real quick, David, do you think she held back? I mean, do you think she could have landed further punches but kind of reined herself in a bit? 
No, I don't think so. I thought she was very strong on the coronavirus. I thought she had a very good answer about the stakes on the Supreme Court. I would like to see this question about democracy and Trump suggesting he's not going to abide by the election results. I think that could be a great moment for Joe Biden. I don't think they've made him pay the full price for that, because I think 80 percent of the American people believe whoever gets the most votes should be the next president. David and Hugh, thank you. Let's go to Chief White House Correspondent Hallie Jackson, who's in Washington. Hallie, um, we heard from the president, I know, earlier before the debate. We know he likes to tweet during the debate. Uh, what have you heard from the White House tonight? He you know, he tweeted some, Savannah, not as much as what we saw during the vice presidential debate back in 2016 when he was essentially live tweeting it. But we know the president was, at least from his Twitter account, engaged as he is, of course, isolated in the residence because of his coronavirus diagnosis, something that, as Lester points out, had been hanging heavy as this backdrop over the debate, but uh, didn't seem to be front and center as a focus as much as I think some people thought it might have been. What's interesting is Senator Harris really working to, as we've talked about, prosecute the case against not Mike Pence, but against Donald Trump. In many ways, she was speaking past Pence at President Trump and to the American people. You saw her uh, implement that strategy that Joe Biden did last time around, where she turned to the camera, she's doing it there, talked right to Americans, tried to make her case on things like health care, but largely going after the president's leadership on a variety of issues, going after, for example, the president's transparency, focusing on Donald Trump far more than Mike Pence. For his part, what was interesting was the vice president ticking some of the boxes that President Trump did not last week when it came to issues that are critically important in some of these battleground states like NAFTA, for example, things in the industrial Midwest, like jobs, the economy, the fight against China as well. These are key talking points for the, for the vice president, and that is what he, he stuck on today, Savannah. All right, we're going to take a quick break here. We'll be back in a moment with more analysis. Stay with us. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America 
to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Amina, will look down from heaven and be proud. This year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. How, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. All right, one of the things we saw in tonight's debate is uh, the Republicans, the Trump uh, campaign certainly sees it as a virtue how quickly they have moved toward a vaccine. The Democrats, the Biden campaign, fearful. And that came out in this conversation about what would happen when a vaccine is fielded. Here's a conversation. If the public health professionals, if Dr. Fauci, if the doctors, Tell us that we should take it. I'll be the first in line to take it. Absolutely. But if Donald Trump tells us I should ta that we should take it, I'm not taking it. So the fact that you continue to undermine public confidence in a vaccine, exactly. if the vaccine emerges during the Trump administration, I think is, is unconscionable. And, Senator, I, I just ask you, stop playing politics with people's lives. The reality is that we will have a vaccine, we believe, before the end of this year. And it will have the capacity to save countless American lives. And, and your continuous undermining uh, of confidence in a vaccine is just, it, it's just unacceptable. So let's turn to NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres. Don, we've heard, John, we've heard this argument before. Ex explain, we, we know that we're moving quicker to a vaccine than has ever been done before. And that's a given. But are there certain steps that are going to happen regardless that have to happen before it hits market? And Lester, you're absolutely right. And right now, the main thing is to make sure it's safe. And to do that, the FDA just put out new guidance saying they want to wait two months until people get their last vaccine in the trials to make sure it's safe. But what Vice President Pence didn't mention there is the fact that, that they themselves are doing a little bit of undermining because the president today tweeted out exactly saying this new FDA rules make it more difficult for them to speed up vaccines for approval before Election Day, just another political hit job. And so, you know, what we're seeing here is on both sides, you know, getting accused of doing a politics behind the vaccine instead of doing health behind the vaccine. And like uh, Senator Harris said, you know, she'd take it if doctors said to take it, but wouldn't take it if President Trump said to take All it. All right, John, thanks. Savannah. And also standing by for us, NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule. And as mentioned before, there was a lot of talk that seemed dedicated to convincing voters in the industrial Midwest, where manufacturing, where fracking are huge issues, a lot of claims flying back and forth about the economy. What did you take away? Well, let's start. Mike Pence said President Trump is responsible for the greatest economic turnaround. It wasn't a turnaround. GDP was basically between 2 and 2.5% two and for both President Obama and President Trump. We had expansion under President Trump because of the corporate tax cut. Now, Mike Pence said that Joe Biden is going to take away that tax cut and raise everyone's taxes. That's not true. He is looking to roll back some of the corporate tax cut. Anyone making less than $400,000 a year will stay intact. And one last point. Mike Pence said people now have $2,000, a family of four, because of President Trump's tax cut. They would lose that if it was taken away. Joe Biden is not looking to take that away. That's the expanded child tax credit that went from $1,000 to $2,000. People would, st would still have that under a Biden presidency. All right, Stephanie, thank you so much. We're going to be back with some final thoughts and a look ahead when we continue in a moment. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. 
protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle-class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. This year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. How, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. some perspective on tonight's debate. Let's bring in NBC News presidential historian Michael Beschloss. Michael, uh, you know, we talk about the, the, the second on the ticket often doesn't really move the needle. Did you see anything tonight that makes you think that this, this would be an exception? Well, I think it's it's almost the dog that did not mark, bark, because if history tells us anything, Lester, the, the central question tonight was, does Kamala Harris, the candidate we haven't known, facing the biggest audience of her life, did she look and sound like a plausible president and vice president? The answer, at least from my point of view, she sure did. She passed that test. As for Mike Pence, people know him. He kept interrupting his moderator, a woman, and his opponent, a woman. Some may feel that that showed lack of respect. Yeah, that'll be something we'll see play out in the next day or two. Right, but again, let's end as we started. I think a big sigh of relief that it was just, you know, in the realm of normal for a presidential or vice presidential debate. That concludes our coverage. A full calendar ahead, of course, next Thursday, another presidential debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden in Miami. For all of us at NBC News, thank you for joining us. Good night, everybody.